Thank you. I can confirm we're live now, Chairman. Super. So welcome everyone to our virtual meeting, of Children and Young People Select Committee. The meeting is being webcast on YouTube via the County Council website. I'll begin by reading the names of members on the committee so they can confirm their attendance for public record. Um, please unmute after I've read your name and confirm your attendance when your name's called, um, and then we can ensure you'll be heard. If a member miss, wishes to speak, then please indicate by raising your hand and I will call you to speak in turn. All decisions will be reached verbally. And I would like to remind members that the County Council standing orders continue to apply. So please keep your microphone muted unless you've been called to speak. Um, and then you'll be visible on screen to the public and other members. OK, so roll call. We've got myself, the chairman, Councillor Kirsty North. We've got our Vice Chairman, Councillor Ray Bolton. Uh, present. Thank you. Excuse Councillor me. Jackie Branson. Present. Councillor Anne Briggs. Present, Chairman. Councillor Zillia Brooks. Present, <coughs> present, Chairman, sorry. Councillor Fran Carpenter. Present, Chairman. Councillor Peter Edgar. Present, thank you. Councillor Powell Hare. Present Chairman. Councillor Wayne Irish. Present Chair, thank you. Councillor Neville, oh, Councillor Gavin James, who I understand is apologies. <coughs> uh, Councillor Neville Penman. Present Chairman. Councillor Jackie Porter. Present. Councillor Robert Taylor. Present. Councillor Malcolm Wade. Present and good morning, Chairman. Good morning. Councillor Michael Westbrook. Present, Chairman. And Councillor Bill Withers. Present, Chairman. Thank you. Ian Brewerton, the Parent Governor Representative for Secondary Schools. Present, Chair. Gareth Davis, the Parent Governor Representative for Primary Schools. Present, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, do we have Kate Watson, the Parent Governor Representative for Special Schools? No, I don't think she's joined yet, Chairman. OK. And Robert Sanders, the Church of England Diocese Representative. Present, Chair. And we have Councillor Bruce Tennant um, substituting for Councillor Gavin James. Present, Chair. Super. Thank you. And we also welcome Councillor Patricia Stallard, the Executive Lead Member for Children's Services and Young People, and Councillor Ros Chad, the Executive Member for Education and Skills, to the meeting. Thank you, Chairman. And I understand uh, Councillor Jonathan Glenn is also um, watching our meeting, so welcome to him too. Thank you very much, Chairman. So, uh, item number one, apologies for absence. Sorry, I did sort of dive into that earlier but I believe it's Gavin James. It's Gavin James apologies and we have Councillor Bruce Tennant substituting. Super thank you Jackie. So item two declaration of interest if anyone has any declarations for an item to be discussed today could they just declare it? Robert Sanders. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I've recently become a trustee of the Playhouse Foundation, which is a charity that supports uh, parents with um, autistic children. No problem. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fran Carpenter. Yes, uh, my husband works for Autism Hampshire. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jackie Porter. Um, it's only a mention in the minutes. Um, uh, one of the charities that talked last time uh, Kingsworthy Preschool, I'm a trustee of it. Um, actually, I've got good news to report that since that last meeting, we had a crowdfunding in the own, their own village and they raised £5,000 from the parish, um, from the residents and from £1,000 from the parish. So that made a considerable difference. Thank you. That is good news. Great. OK, so we'll move on to item three, which is the minutes. Um, Minutes of the meeting held on the 8th of July 2020, which you find in your agenda pack. Um, if you could let me know if there are any queries, otherwise we will agree those. I'm not hearing anything, so we'll, if everyone's happy, we'll take those as agreed. 
Item four, deputations. I don't think no we have any deputations. Today. No. no, thank you. So item five, chairman's announcements. So that's me. So we meet just over two weeks after the serious accident in Winchester involving a stagecoach bus carrying children to Henry Beaufort School. And I'd just like to take this opportunity on behalf of all the members of our committee, um, I'm sure, to extend our best wishes to all of the children injured or otherwise affected in the accident. We wish them a speedy and full recovery. Members will also recall that at the July Select Committee, we agreed an additional recommendation in relation to childcare sufficiency assessment and COVID-19 impact and the response from the childcare sector. Um, you will have received by email a copy of the letter sent to Vicky Ford, the Parliamentary Undersecretary of State for Children and Families in relation to this. So that's all from me. We'll move on to item six, the COVID update. And I believe that our director, Steve Crocker, will be walking us through this with the help of his assistant directors. Good, uh, good morning, members. Um, this is uh, an additional item in your ModGov pack, so you'll um, you might need to come out of um, the the, um, uh, the the one that you're in, and um, in order to, to view it, and I'll. Um, can I just check with Jackie? Can you, Jackie, can you put it on the screen or do you want me to put it on the screen? Are you able to, Steve? Is that OK? I, I was just um, testing myself with technology, so I am I will put it on the screen. <laughs> I hope. And um, I'll ask my colleagues to to walk through it. it it's, it's similar in structure to the previous one. Um, in, in other words, what we're going to do is walk through the different service areas, tell you how we're faring in uh, each of them, and um, stop at the end of each section in order to take questions on the specifics about th those those service areas. Um, what I will say, uh, and it, there's no um, uh, sort of uh, <laughs> prizes for guessing on this one, is that it, it's extremely busy for us at the moment in lots of ways, um, whether it's helping schools to sort out bubbles, whether it's responding to, to issues, um, that are happening in schools, whether it's um, the um, increasing in, in children's social care referrals, whether it's sorting out high school transport, early years providers, uh, all of our staff are absolutely flat out and uh, working as, as hard as they can. And they have been all the way over the, the, the summer as, uh, as well. Um, so I'm hoping that, that this um, is now presenting. Um, can somebody give me a nod to say that the um, presentation is on the, it on the is, screen? Yeah, yeah I've got yes. a thumbs up from somebody. Right. OK, in which case, um, uh, the first section is going to be around uh, children's social care um, uh, dimensions. And Stuart, I can't, I'm hoping he's there, but there's such a long list that I, I can't see him. But it's, I think Stuart's going to lead us off on, on this. I am. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Good morning, members. This is a short update uh, to the presentation I gave before. Um, and we'll, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, where we're at and, and how we're adapting to things. Um, so if I could have that slide. Thank you, Steve. Um, so you, you'll know from previous uh, presentations, we took a three phased approach uh, based on diminishing numbers of, of staff. We stayed in phase one, which was business as usual, but doing it differently. <clears throat> and then we emerged from that over the last couple of months as restrictions eased, so that we're doing around about 90, 95% face-to-face visits with children and families now. Um, all of our assessments are being done face-to-face. Uh, uh, -face. Obviously, staff are having to uh, ensure that buildings are, are COVID secure, and that if necessary, if, if for example, someone might be symptomatic and we need to see them, then we'll use PPE. But in the main, we're being able to safely do face-to-face -face visits. Um, all children within the service, so that's roughly around about, just over 10,000 children will have been seen by the end of September if they haven't had a face-to-face -face -face visit over the last few uh, months. And of course, remember that we have children coming into the service and leaving the service, so it's a, a constant churn. But I'm really, pleased to be able to assure uh, this committee that children's social care have been able to maintain 
a, a service as near to normal as possible throughout and we've changed and adapted as those restrictions have eased. Interestingly, um, uh, with the recent, before, when I wrote these slides, uh, it was before the government announced that if you can uh, work from home, you should. And I think that will be a, a particular challenge for my service. Um, social workers need that social interaction with their colleagues uh, and their peers uh, in terms of the emotional support and their own well-being. So we're looking at um, how we can adapt uh, 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 facilities so that teams can get together in COVID secure ways. Uh, we may even have to hire um, some rooms so that they can regularly meet uh, because currently a lot of our office space, as members will be aware, uh, isn't able to accommodate, say, a, a group of 12 or 14 uh, social workers and, and, and other practitioners. So we're doing all of that as we go into you know, the next phase, and it's phase after phase, as everybody's aware. If I could have the next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you. So this is a, a, an update on the data slide. Steve uh, described in his opening as uh, things are incredibly busy in children's services. From a children's social care perspective, it's probably the busiest I've ever known it, and I've been in the service a long time. We predicted um, some months back that we would see a surge. The surge started earlier. We thought it would be September. The reality is it started in June. Um, and it has continued. It's the first part of September has been exceptionally busy. What you've got on the screen there um, is sort of year-on-year -year comparison. So you can see each month from April uh, compared to the month before. And um, month on month, it's busier. We've seen some of the highest numbers of referrals coming into the MASH, the Multi-Agency Safeguarding Hub, in the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, and the complexity of the work, as I've described to you before, has increased over the last few months, and that's certainly been sustained. So we're seeing some really complex situations around neglect and child abuse um, that we're having to respond to. And uh, as an example, on one day, there were 22 uh, strategy meetings in the MASH, which is where we're having a child protection investigation. It's the preliminary meeting with the police to just agree how that's going to happen. On a, on a busy week, normally, I would expect 10. So 22 gives you an example of just how busy it's been. Um, I'm confident that we're able to manage that um, uh, at this stage, but clearly um, it has put a, a strain on the service and will continue to. We've got some additional resource that we're exploring uh, to support both MASH and the district teams in dealing with that, because this work will work its way through the system. Uh, and two other points I would just briefly make. One is we have seen an increase in children subject to child protection plans, where a multi-agency plan is needed to ensure that they are safe. And we've also seen a, a, an increase in our children in care numbers. Um, and I expect that to continue for a while because it does take a while for children to, to journey through the social care system to happen. So those numbers of children in care may continue to go up for some months to come. Next slide, please. Um, we've done, uh, I won't go into a lot of detail around um, work with schools because clearly Brian will talk to that, but I, I think it's important to stress the, the really good join up that there's been uh, between uh, children's social care, Brian's branch, uh, education and inclusion and the schools, a real triangle of support, focusing on vulnerable children, ensuring that as many as possible are in school. So the, you've got some data there uh, through that. This was through the uh, period of lockdown where key workers, children, vulnerable children should be in school. Some of our figures I think were really impressive compared to many authorities. And Brian and I have agreed um, that we will continue to work closely together around vulnerable children more generally to make sure they have gone back to school uh, and uh, if they're not in school that we know about it so that collectively children's social care and the schools can work together to do something on that. Uh, and they've got a sort of hotline as it were into children's social care for each of the schools if they want, if they've got particular concerns around a child not attending so that I can ensure we respond. Um, and we, Brian and I recently met with some heads who were really pleased at the way the support had been given to them both over the summer and now into the autumn. Next slide, please. Um, very briefly, our work with partners continues and um, I have to say uh, it's been a strength 
uh, that's been brought to the, uh, all of the services, the way that we've been able to work together uh, around vulnerable children. I won't touch on that anymore. Uh, next, next slide, please. So, um, and then what next? I've touched on this briefly. We're looking at where staff can go back to offices if they need to, that they can do that and the buildings are, are, are COVID secure. We're looking at opportunities for teams to come together in a way that allows them to be safe, but still have contact with their peers. Uh, and we're focusing on hybrid meetings. So where perhaps the parents and the social worker will be in the room, uh, but other professionals can dial in through teams and other means such as Zoom so that we can ensure that there's good multi-agency support for families. And that uh, is my update. I think the next slide is um, for questions. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Jackie Porter, did you want to ask your question that you've raised in the chat? Yes, please. Um, I can get most acronyms, but I couldn't. Re I couldn't remember what ICPC and RCPC means. It's Initial Child Protection Conference and re and uh, Review Child Protection Conference. Oh, thank you, thank you. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Just most of them we understand, and we can just yeah. ask. But actually, it's more difficult. Um, just one question, really. Um, do you find that uh, your your staff obviously are working really, really hard? Uh, are they working, are they ending up working more hours or just trying to fit the same into the same hours? I'm, I'm conscious of burnout and and the challenge that that brings and I know Stuart alluded to it, but is there, well, come on, I just wondered if there's uh, anything that's being done about that and whether uh, anything that schools can provide because they're used to working in bubbles and things like if the children are in school. Um, in, in terms of, um, sort of the social work staff, uh, I have to say um, it's been a learning process. Um, I know that initially over the, the earlier months, staff were saying that they felt they were always at work because their work was in their bedroom with them. You know, the, 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 the laptop was always there and, and available. Uh, and we've done a lot of work ensuring that staff take leave, that they take toil, um, that they, they, they take all of the... Um, uh, they put in place all of the supports that they need to make sure they can uh, manage that home work balance. And I think we're getting there. It's still a struggle for some staff. It definitely is. Um, and I think uh, I'll be absolutely candid with the committee. I think the message about work from you should work from home if you can, that, that, that hit morale for a bit. Um, and we're still sort of talking about that, which is one of the reasons I'm really keen that staff get together in, in larger groups uh, where they safely can to get that support and so that's that's the sort of focus but I think we're getting there with the balance but it's it's about adapting I guess that that support I just want to say something on that support that mutual support thing and so on uh, and I, people might think that's a bit of a a luxury I suppose in some respects but you have to remember that social workers are going out and they are seeing some of the worst things that you can imagine and they're doing that on a daily basis and they absolutely do need to talk to their peers and colleagues about that uh, it's the way frankly that they stay sane and also professionally it's the way in which they measure things against each other so that they've got a good sense of what is um uh you know acceptable or not acceptable if i can put it that way and it's absolutely critical to the good functioning of the organisation uh, in terms of children's social care. So it's not, you know, it's not, a, uh, I don't know how to express it, but it, it's not a sort of, um, it's not a, uh, a, a lot of <laughs> shrinking violets, um, sort of, um, you know, in a mutual support group. This is really hard edged professional stuff that people need to come together um, in order to, to compare notes and, and to make sure, and to check out what, what it is that they're seeing and what, what's happening. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't, that, that's really important for us. We don't yet have the solution because of the, the new government guidelines, but we were we were keen and probably still are really to try and find ways to get our staff into um, into uh, safe scenarios that they can uh, meet up on a reasonably regular basis. That's why I asked the question, because yeah. I've noticed a distinct change in 
attitude towards it to be told that the next six months is like this, particularly if there are more than one of you working in a household. Um, and it's toss a coin of who gets the bedroom and who gets the sitting room. And uh, to take your work into your bedroom is a really personal thing, I think, and it's um, very underestimated of how serious it feels to someone, mm. particularly if, as you say, you're wanting to keep a sense of proportion about the work you're doing. So I'm very supportive of any principle that can allow them to, do, to actually physically meet. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Councillor Malcolm Wade, please. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I, I seem to remember having been in a discussion earlier on in the pandemic, where I think Steve, or, or Stuart, one of you said, that as we come out of this, the workload will increase, and you are absolutely right, and that's what's happened. And I, and I don't doubt that this is a very challenging time for the social workers. I, I, I totally get what you just said. But the question I want to ask is, taking into account the financial pressures we were on before the pandemic, the financial pressures that we are now have due to the pandemic, and the pressures on the staff because clearly uh, mental health issues, that whole thing around that, both for the staff and, and for many of the young children that they're dealing with, is increased because of the pandemic. Are you confident we can sustain this level of activity going forward? Because we are, we're not at the end of this. We're on a journey through this pandemic. Yeah. Uh, and that, to me, is, is the issue. Okay? Yeah. Can we sustain it, the good work that we're doing? Thanks, Malcolm. I, I think at this stage, the issue is not uh, um, financial. It will be the issue um, as, as time goes on. I'm absolutely certain um, nationally, not not, um, not even locally. Um, so just to the sustainability point, the, if you look at the data, what that was showing was um, throughout July and August, roughly a, between a 10 and 15 percent increase in work coming into the system um we haven't put september's up because obviously september isn't finished yet but um you can take it from me that september's been more busy than that and mm. one week in particular was an absolute nightmare um that seems to have settled down a bit uh, this week um 10 to 15 percent 10 to 15 percent increase is what we've worked with on the treasurer and what we have budgeted for going forward and that seems to be a sensible um uh, contingency. Um, if it is 50% increase, then that isn't sustainable. It isn't sustainable for anybody, frankly. Um, but that isn't. I don't think that's what's um, what's going to happen. The, so the the financial um, sort of contingencies have been made. Actually, the bigger issue for us, and Stuart will probably elaborate. The bigger issue for us has been finding people. Um, to, so it's not that the money isn't there. It's about trying to find the right people to come in. And, uh, and and bolster our front line. And we've done quite a lot of work about that. And we tried to, where somebody was, for example, where somebody was covering maternity leave post and they were due to end as an agency worker, we kept them on because we knew that we were going to get additional work. So we've done that where we can. But there hasn't been a load of people wanting to come into new places to work precisely because of the whole COVID pandemic thing. So it's it's not the easiest to find the right people to come into the role. Stuart, what, can you elaborate on that a bit? Um, <clears throat> I, I certainly can. So we know that there's a national sh shortage of social workers and we know Hampshire is no different in the sense that we use agency social workers um, to support our, our workforce. Um, it's particularly difficult to recruit agency social workers because they're not wanting to change authorities because of the amount of uncertainty uh, that there is. Um, and at the same time, we're, we're, whilst we're constantly looking to recruit experienced social workers, there just aren't many out there. So we've looked at other ways that we can support the social workers. As Steve said, where we have got uh, uh, agency social workers in the system, then we're making sure they stay with us. Um, we're also looking at what can we bring in some other practitioners to support the social work tasks and functions. So we've got a sort of hybrid approach to it, and I think that's that's working for us. One of the things I'm particularly keen for us to do is to keep social work caseloads low and manageable. Therefore, we can uh, adhere to our practice framework because we know 
that that helps keep more children safely at home. So that's been the driver around is supporting our staff um, by using additional resource where we can and doing things slightly differently um, in terms of some of the practitioners that we're, we're uh, deploying with families so that we can maintain uh, that practice framework. And to date, it's worked well. I have to say, um, back in April uh, and May, when we had less uh, work coming into the system, social workers were very good at sort of clearing the decks. We knew that it was going to be busy uh, towards the end of the summer and into September. So where we can, we've, we've managed to um, work to close a number of cases where that's safe and appropriate to do so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fran Carpenter, please. Yes, thank you. It's, it's quite shocking, those, those figures of 50, around the 50% that you were talking about earlier. Um, and I mean, I know some of the main reasons, the reasons these happen, but I just wondered what the main reasons are for this number of children coming in suddenly. It would be just interesting if you would recap on that. Um, uh, but also, what preventative action are we and schools taking to try and prevent these things happening in homes to start with? Um, are we working with other agencies and partners to try and stop this stem of the stem this flow of children coming in? I'll, I'll just start. There's a couple of things in there. Um, so firstly is to remember that we are in essence a referral agency. So and most of those referrals come from professionals. In fact, more than 80% of those um, referrals come from other professionals, whether they're health visitors, teachers, police, whatever. Um, and where other professionals are not having eyes on those children, that was when we had the decrease in, in April and May. And I think our increase, and I, I wouldn't want to mislead in that the general increase is between 10 and 15%, but we did have one week. And I think the one week was essentially the, re the return to school. And the schools rightly sort of looked at all their kids and said, oh, we need to make a referral in about this child. And what we may well, in fact, have already had inf that information. Proportionately fewer of those cases went through to assessment because we were able to filter some out because we'd got already got the information but schools are doing the right thing that looks like that return to school bulge has probably um declined um so that's uh, that that's hopeful in terms of um what's coming through i mean Stuart again will elaborate but there's some really complex difficult stuff and that is often in regards to families that we have not previously um, been involved with. And essentially, um, without sort of, um, uh, I don't want to dramatise or sort of stereotype, but uh, some families are, that probably would never have come to our attention, have effectively broken down during the, uh, the pandemic and lockdown for whatever reason. And uh, those are the ones that are coming to our attention through uh, sort of very serious domestic abuse and violence, um, sometimes exacerbated by substance misuse and poor parental mental health, the classic sort of trigger trio that we, we see a lot of. Um, the access to families during this period has been quite difficult in terms of universal services and preventive services, and that's been part of the story here as, as, as well. So those families have not felt, even if there were provision, they've not always felt able to go out and access that provision because it's been, uh, they've, you know, they've been locked down. Stuart, do you want to elaborate on any of that? There's not a lot I can add. I think you captured it all very well, Steve. I suppose the one other factor we're starting to see is unemployment. That's impacting both in terms of poverty, but I think at this stage, more importantly, what we're seeing is the impact on adult mental health, which is leading to increased domestic abuse and substance misuse, that trigger trio that Steve talked about. So that's another factor that is meaning that families are less resilient and then they're going into significant crisis. Uh, and we have no option when we find out about what's happening in the homes, but to make applications to court to keep children safe because they're living in environments that, um, frankly, we cannot guarantee that they are safe in. Uh, now that's that's difficult. Um, that's difficult for the children. It's difficult for the families. But I do think it's because a lot's been happening behind closed doors, uh, and then as we've started to emerge and um, 
furlough has ended for uh, many people um, at, at the cost of their jobs that we're starting to see all of those ingredients in the pot again. Uh, and we've seen some very unpleasant cases, very unpleasant. And I, that goes back to the earlier point about social workers needing the support because of what they're having to see, um, often on their own or with a police officer. And the second, I think the second part of the question was about the preventative work and schools. <clears throat> and I think schools have been doing a, a really, really good job at uh, knowing, and again, Brian will talk in more detail, I'm sure, knowing who their vulnerable children are and their vulnerable families, referring them rightly to children's social care for support. But let's not forget our early help offer has been maintained, certainly from a children's services perspective. Clearly not as many partners have been in uh, a position to offer support to families. Uh, health colleagues, clearly they had priorities elsewhere and they were often redeployed elsewhere to that effect. But I think um, we, our early help offer continues to be a strong offer and we are picking up a lot of families now at an earlier stage, which over time, as we know, will prevent them escalating to children's social care. So I think there's some really, really good work from the schools and from other partners uh, in, in supporting these children families. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Councillor Michael Westbrook, then, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart and Steve, for, for the presentation. Can I just go back to the beginning where you talked about 95% face-to-face -face visits and um, and how you're, you know, you're catching up with most of those visits and will have done by the end of September. Back in July, Stuart, I think you talked about young people engaging really, really well online to online meetings. And I wonder if that's still continuing because obviously that is something you wouldn't want to lose sight of if if that was an effective way of, uh, of talking to people. It's a, a really good question. Thank you. Um, I'm, yes, is the short answer. The government has recently removed many of the flexibilities around regulations for children's social care, but that's one of the regulations that has been, uh, the amendment has been kept, that we do, do have the ability to see uh, children and families by digital means or the use of technology. Um, my position on it is I wouldn't want that to become um, the only means. So what I've said is if, if you, we know it works really well with a teenager that finds it difficult to engage, why not try and do every other one via uh, WhatsApp uh, so that we still try and have contact where possible. In a very small number of cases, we may, we may stick, particularly care leaders where they're over 18, we may stick with digital if we think that works best. But for children, I still want staff to actually physically see them. Uh, and I think there's something about that as well. I, we've had examples during lockdown where um, uh, a mother was showing us around her house via uh, WhatsApp. But actually what we didn't see was that someone that shouldn't have been in the house was in another room. It was, it's quite easy to um, it's quite easy to miss things for social workers. So I'm, I am clear that we need to have uh, maintain face to face, but we will continue to use uh, WhatsApp and various apps to supplement that as well. Thanks, Stuart. Thank you. And finally, Councillor Ray Bolton, our Vice Chairman, please. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Stuart, this increase in referrals, and you, you have mentioned about um, cases going before the court. Is this leading uh, to an increase in children being taken into care? And if so, how do how does the council stand um, as far as the number of um, fosters, people who um, are, are prepared to do that? Well, it's due coming on the fostering point, um, but the, there is um, it, the answer. The short answer is yes. Uh, it, there has been a bulge in the number of children in care since since May, um, which uh, is entirely lockdown related. And my point about the finance finances earlier was that, um, of course, once a child is in care, there is a long term financial cost. And this is one of the points that we're making to government is that um, for us and for those children, COVID doesn't end when the vaccine is found. There is a long, long term um, financial um, and, and actually practical issue about those young people who, who come into care during, during the um, COVID lockdown. So that's one of the things that's in, it's been, it, it's in our medium term financial um, uh, forecast. 
uh, and I've been working very closely with the Treasurer on, on that issue. And that's where the, the 10 to 15 per cent comes in in terms of financial cost as well. That's the I wanted to get that in because I, you know that will come back to this committee at some point, I'm sure. But um, the, the point about uh, the practicalities, I Stuart will pick up. Um, in, in terms of uh, foster carers, uh, interestingly enough, what we've seen over the last six months uh, is an increase in people uh, making inquiries about becoming a foster carer. And we think that because actually what's happened across the world is making people reflect on their own life and maybe they could offer support or care for, for children. Um, and perhaps whilst it might have been something they thought of at a distance before, they're now making more uh, significant inquiries. We still then have to take them through quite a lengthy process to approve them as foster carers, but we certainly have more in the pipeline than we've had for a while. Not enough by any means. Uh, and you're absolutely right, there is there is a, a real stress on the system around placements for children in care, whether that's residential or foster care. Um, and even where we commission placements from the independent sector, um, there's not enough placements there either. All local authorities are experiencing, I think we've heard of an 8% increase in children in care um, since uh, lockdown and, and the pandemic, um, which means you know, those placements have got to be found. So it is a, it's a difficult position. I have to say we have um, a program called uh, Modernising Placements Program, a transformational program around our fostering services and our residential services. Uh, and I think that puts us really ahead of the curve longer term. So in the long term, I'm confident in the short term, I'm afraid there's going to be some, some pressure on the system. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart and Steve. Thank you. Shall we move on to the next section, Chair? Is that OK with you? Yeah, please go ahead. OK, so then I'm going to um, just hand over to Brian then around education and inclusion. Brian, over to you. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, so, so members, you'll be aware from my last presentation that um, we worked um, really hard last term in trying to make sure that schools were as well prepared as they could be. And that work continued over the summer holiday. Um, trying to make sure that every single school um, and college were interpreting the DfE public health advice uh, nationally. Uh, and the focus there, as you'd anticipate, is the hygiene advice, creating the bubbles, putting in place one-way systems, having staggered starts, finishes um, and breaks. Um, on top of that, obviously, there was the work we did with schools to try and make sure that the initial lessons were the right lessons, so a, a period of reinduction back into school. And yes, having um, a real focus on well-being, but also assessing where the children were with their learning and getting back to um, teaching the curriculum. So it was a multi-pronged uh, approach, getting the in induction lessons. We, we did some training with schools on what we called the recovery curriculum, and we had 180 head teachers turn up at those that, that wanted to kind of get the principles underpinning those rights. Um, so far this term, the attendance rates have been high. Um, you'll see there's some um, stats that I've put into the presentation. Typically, we are trending about four or five percentage points above national. Those stats um, were, were under, I put those stats in when I first wrote the presentation about 10 days ago. Primary at that stage was artificially depressed because the year art um, students don't come back full time necessarily, the four year olds, for the first couple of weeks. When I last checked, which was the last stats I had was Thursday, primary attendance is now up at 95%. Um, but typically, our attendance is better than the national norm. Thanks, Steve. I've got the next slide. <clears throat> um, dare I mention it? So the, the GCSE and A-level, um, you, you'll be aware from all the press cuttings uh, uh, over the summer what happened with those. So I won't go into the, the details with all the last minute changes that happened. But suffice to say, what we focused on in the local authority and what we encouraged schools and college to focus on was not the national debate um, around algorithms or teacher assessment, but actually focusing on the students. So our career service was open, um, schools were open, guiding students and parents. I have to say, I think our colleges worked really hard at taking in students 
that perhaps didn't quite get the grade and they've reached down to schools incredibly well to try and take those those students to make sure they'd all got a clear pathway into a post-16 situation. Sim similarly, the post-18 pathway, when we talk to college leaders, they are saying that universities work really hard again to reach down to try and make sure that most students had um, a college, a university placement of their choice. So despite all the furore that went on with the grading, um, most students did get a college of their course, the course of their um, choice, and, and have gone on to university. We're, we're now working on what we call the September Guarantee, and what that is is trying to make sure that every single um, child across Hampshire at 16 is either in employment, education, or training, and we're hopeful that we'll have low, neat figures when that when those stats are published um, next month. That's one of the areas we're really focusing on. Next slide, please. Um, a huge piece of our work now is positive case management. Um, it was always going to be when we had cases, not if. And I think over the first three weeks of schools being open, we've had around. 30 schools um, report positive cases across Hampshire. Um, the first couple of weeks, we were averaging about six positive cases a week. I have to say that's increased, and we're currently dealing with two or three positive cases a day now. And those are made up of both students and staff. Um, when we have a positive case, the school improvement team are working incredibly closely with head teachers to support them. Um, working very closely with public health colleagues to make sure the risk assessment is uh, really forensically analysed so that we self-isolate the right students and that appears to be working uh, well, although it, 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 it's challenging. And the media team as well have been supporting schools both in terms of the communications with parents but also handling of media inquiries that have been coming in as, uh, as well. So in some incredible joint working across public health, education colleagues, schools and the media team. The, the other piece of work that we're doing is preparing schools to switch to remote learning when um, students do have to um, self-isolate. Um, very happy to answer some questions on that, but we did an awful lot of research about what did and didn't work during the lockdown period, and we are learning the lessons from 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 that. So I'm happy to pick that up in, in questions if members would like me to. And the other part of the scheme there, just so you're aware, is um, the DfE now have a new scheme which um, will come into operation shortly, whereby if a school does have to isolate a bubble, those students that are disadvantaged will have access apparently within two days to a device and we're currently working with the DfE to put that in, in place. So what are our next phases? Um, we are in really regular contact with school leaders. The services that are in the education and inclusion branch are back out in schools, so the specialist teacher advisors they are continuing to do some work online, but some of that work has to necessarily take place face to face with students. Similarly, with educational psychology, some of the assessments we need to do, we need to see the students and their work face to face, so we're doing that. Members of HIAS are back out in schools again, supporting them. We dealt with two headships of secondary schools last week, and uh, members of HIAS were involved supporting the governing bodies with that. So, Services are out there, back out there with schools, with a, with a proper risk assessment um, around them. Um, as Stuart picked up, we, we're going to have a relentless focus. We will continue our relentless focus on vulnerable students. And those students that are open to social worker, if they're not attending schools regularly, we have a dedicated email address that Stuart's team is overseeing so that we can get social workers engaged to work with those families to try and encourage the students back into school. Uh, I think I, I looked at the primary um, stat this morning and we've got 90% of students with a social worker back in school um, there. So the numbers returning are, are good. Um, we're doing a lot of work looking at the evidence, um, both in terms of the recovery curriculum, but also catch up strategies and are drawing hugely on the work of the Education Endowment um, Foundation. Um, there is £350 million being made available to schools in Hampshire for catch-up, and we want to make sure that's used effectively. £350 million sounds like an awful lot of money, um, but if I tell you it works out as £80 a student, you'll see that 
Um, it, it's going to be quite a limited intervention, but nonetheless welcomed. And the last initiative I just wanted to mention was the government are funding in Hampshire um, a wellbeing programme, funding all um, local authority areas. Um, we've got about 190,000 for that. It's a national programme. Um, we've just done the train the trainer sessions nationally, and those trainers will be rolling out um, their learning over the next month and slightly into November. There's a, a kind of national slide pack that, that, that supports that training to try and make sure that um, leads for well-being in schools have got all the information that they require to do the job well. They're also signposting to the various um, support services we've got around well-being, which are extensive in Hampshire, actually. We've got good support me um, mechanisms. Um, I think those are my slides, Steve. I think it's questions next. Thank you for that, Brian. Um, we'll go to Councillor Jackie Branson. She was first. Thank you very much. Um, there seemed to be some delay in children who have AHCPs. Um, I just wondered if we've caught up with that and whether the schools have got all the details that they need. Thank you. Um, we, we, there's a presentation specifically on special needs in a, in a little while later on the agenda, and I'm sure Tracy will want to pick up on that point. But basically, we had 1,400 students um, awaiting for an AHCP once the censor scheme um, disappeared. Um, in November, I'm pleased to report that we've been um, turning out about 150 EHCPs a month. Um, we should, by the end of September, have completely cleared that backlog. Um, similarly, with the advices that educational psychologists were doing, at the end of um, August, I know we'd only got 16 advices outstanding, and again, by the end of September, we're expecting that backlog to have disappeared as well. Apologies for the interruption, Chairman. It's Jackie. Um, Steve, would you mind not um, stopping the screen sharing just for the questions? It's just for broadcasting purposes. Yep. Thank you. OK, Councillor Peter Edgar, please. Thank you very much. Um, I've been walking around near schools in Gosport for two years now since I've been unwell. And what was incredible was the amount of irresponsible behaviour by teenagers in particular in parks and places like that. This is going to be seen, it does appear it's going to be an, un, an unhappy situation. What I am absolutely amazed, since these changes have occurred, I've not seen any abuse. I walked best part of five miles two days ago. And I was amazed that the lack of irresponsible that there was, it was a surprise that was so good. That must be uh, we were doing the right thing. That's everybody in the system. And I'm delighted with that result. I just hope it will continue. Yes, we, we, we've done a lot of communication with students, asking them not to congregate out of school. I, I can't say that's been 100% 100 successful. We have had examples of um, children congregating together in groups bigger than six in parks. Um, similarly, I have to say one of the issues we've had to try and overcome is parents congregating at school gates. Mm. Uh, that's been a real issue for us and schools have worked really hard with the comms with parents to say, can you please turn up at the allotted time? That's why we've got staggered starts and finishes so we don't have huge great numbers of parents congregating in groups bigger than six as well. So it, it's not just youngsters, I'm afraid. It's um, um, parents as well that uh, we've had some issues with congregation. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Zilia Brooks. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. It was just about the lot, laptops you, you're giving to children for the uh, remote learning. I think it's an excellent idea because it has worked well in, in, in my area. But I've had some concerns about um, some children are not on broadband. So where do we go? How do we help those sort of uh, that, that sort of child who has no broadband at home? Um, one of the things that they can, the school can provide, we can provide, is a dongle to provide the broadband as well. So it doesn't just come with a device. It comes with a dongle that gives the students access to broadband as well. Thank you. Councillor Anne Briggs. Is your question been answered? Yeah, I thank you, Chairman. I 
took my hand down because my question had been answered. Uh, Thank you. No problem. You just disappeared off the list. Uh, Count, uh, Robert Sanders, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I was just interested with the amount on the news about the shortage of COVID tests and so on. Are there any issues with schools um, and staff who have symptoms and therefore isolating at home and accessing tests and therefore schools struggling with staff sh shortages? Um, good question, Bob. Yeah, yes, it's, that, that's a real issue for us. And I think there are um, a number of issues looking forward. W one is the availability of tests. So um, people that think they may have COVID want to go and get a test. Sometimes that is taking a couple of days to arrange one. So we lose a couple of days of their employment. The other problem we then have is the return of the test results. And we've had examples in Hampshire of teachers have, we're having to wait five or six days for the test result to come through. So that means we've then lost quite a lot of that teacher's time in schools, which makes it difficult. Um, you may be interested to know that what schools have done is rather than remotely teach the children whilst the, ch the children are at home, the teacher is remotely teaching the children in the classroom. So we've got examples of teachers at home um, with their face being beamed live into the classroom through computers and teaching the children through the computer system. Of course, that doesn't solve all the behaviour management issues in the classroom just because teachers up on a screen in the, in the corner. So. Um, you do need some good learning and support assistance in the classroom at the same time or, or an additional teacher. But yes, te tests availability and test result turnaround time has been an issue for us. I also just wondered whether or not there's you know, significant pressure on budgets with should schools need to get in cover, whether or not um, you know, their budgets are suffering as a consequence. Um, again, it's a similar answer, I think, to the social care one. At the moment, schools are coping with that, but depending on how long this protracted period may be, then clearly, you know, as the longer it goes on, the more difficult it will be financially. Thank you. Councillor Jackie Porter. Thank you. Um, many, I've got two, two questions really. The first is that many children that were vulnerable were being served free school meals at home, so they were being taken round to home. And when the voucher scheme happened, those parents chose the voucher scheme, so we lost personal sight of those children except by perhaps telephone. And I wondered if there's anything that's going to be looked at um, if we go back into full lockdown again about how we keep track to make sure that the 90% of children that we have got track of, that we maintain that daily uh, contact, physical contact with those children. Uh, and the second thing is that, um, and, and tied up with that really is the school voucher scheme of uh, half term, of how we're expecting that to continue through the autumn half term and, and into Christmas. And the second point is that um, a lot of children are going back and catching a cold. Uh, so we had quite a few parents say, that their children have caught a cold. Uh, one parent said to me, well, if they can't actually stop each other catching a cold, what chance have we got for stopping them catching COVID in their bubble? But actually, are we giving instructions to parents about the difference between COVID and a cold? And are we, do you think we're suffering as a result of that going back um, challenge of catching each other's germs again? Just on the, on the cold point, Jackie, there's quite a lot of information coming out from DfE in particular about the difference between um, the different types of symptoms. And basically, not to put too fine a point on it, it, if the child has got a snotty nose, they probably haven't got COVID because mm. it doesn't really come out that way. Um, and that sort of message is out there. I think that's becoming quite well understood and people are focusing on the three um, obvious symptoms around yeah. it you know, a cough, uh, a temperature and a yeah. loss of t a t a taste or smell. I think that's, I, I actually think that's that's probably reasonably well understood by parents right. now, okay. actually, to be fair. Okay. Um, free school meals, uh, well, um, one of the things that I would say is that I, I know a number of schools were, um, even with the voucher scheme, were actually going and making sure and checking up on kids, either through making the kids come and get their meals and bring, take them home or taking them to the, the family's house. And it's also, if you go, if you remember when we were in lockdown, 
we'd got to about 50% of our vulnerable children, for which is pretty much the, the, the free school meals cohort, were either in school or, or you know, we had eyes on them. So it, I'm, not to, I'm not trying to um, downplay the issue, but it, 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 we did have pretty good eyes on those, those kids throughout the, the, the summer. I can't remember whether you know, can you remember whether the, the scheme's going on the October half term, Brian? I can't. I don't my, my understanding is it's not currently. Marcus yeah. Rashford is active again in trying to make sure that it it is. But my, my understanding at the moment is there isn't a voucher scheme at half term in October. I'm also concerned that if you know if we end up going back into the, the system again for a two week break, um, I just think it that the voucher scheme actually allows schools to hand that over to a voucher rather than necessarily to their own uh, their own supervision of that child on a daily basis. Um, I'm not suggesting that all schools didn't do it, but I'm not suggesting all schools did do, did do it either. And in view of the fact we've still got 5% off at primary and 9% in secondary, are those children the most vulnerable generally, or do they have a a valid reason for not being at school? Well, I, I mean, the first bit, just to put a context around it, is the national attendance rate in a normal year is 95%. Mm. So, at any, and, and that's um, on a daily basis. But that's so a not, moving 5%, isn't it? In that spot sense? on. Yeah, so, so a child that's not in on the Monday and Tuesday may well be on the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The, the 95% is daily stat. What, what we haven't got is... Um, because we, the data feeds aren't live to local authorities and on, a, on an individual child basis. is I haven't got data around what percentage of children have been in, but I would think it would be much closer to 100%, Jackie. Right, OK. That's encouraging. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Powell here. Hello, thank you. Um, Brian, you mentioned um, what did and what didn't go well during the lock COVID lockdown period. Um, will you be sending us a report on what did go well and what didn't go well? And the other thing is, um, are we prepared for the next six months if should situations get worse? Um, finally, what sort of support are we giving to home ed um, children and parents? Thank you. If I can I'll dive in on the first one in particular, uh, Pal. Um, the, I think... <laughs> When we're at the end of this, and I, you know, I, I dream of being at the end of this, <laughs> we need to evaluate what we've learned, what we've, what's gone well, what hasn't gone well, what, and what then the future looks like, and in terms of uh, the way in which we work. And we've heard from Stuart and from Brian about things that might look different in the future permanently, and I think that's absolutely right. But I think we've got to get to the end of it before we evaluate, and so. Um, you know, uh, maybe this time next year we can we can do that. I'm very happy to bring that to select committee in due course because it will be something that we can all learn from. Um, but uh, I can't I can't see the end of it yet. So when that, when that happens, I'll, I'm more than happy to do it. Um, the um, yes, in terms of the next six months, I think we've uh, the other thing I would say is that I think we've learned quite a lot of lessons already that we we put into the into the next six months and one of those being around um, online tuition and, and, and so forth, uh, you know, we're as ready as we can be. But if anything, the, the last six months has taught us is that you can't predict exactly what's going to happen. It's, it's going to be uh, a, a bumpy ride. Um, and Brian, do you want, sorry, do you want to pick up? Yeah, if, if I may. So, I mean, one of the one of the bits we've learned one of the things we know, and there's great research around, is, is how children learn. We do understand the science of learning. And typically, if I take a, a classic three-part lesson, there's the site of instruction where the teacher um, gives an introduction to some new learning. Then there's a site of application where you give them some work to do to see if they can apply the new learning. And then you come back to a site of instruction at the end of plenary where you're looking at their learning analyzing any misconceptions in there and picking those up in the in the kind of plenary session what happened during the initial period of lockdown is we had some um, schools that tried to do 100 percent online um, with teaching through a computer and 
what that meant, what we found is that the schools that did that, actually very little of the learning stuck because the students were not given sufficient opportunity to use that site of application and then to assess what they'd actually learned with a teacher just talking through a microphone at them and a computer, it didn't really stick. Similarly, one of the bits we also found out was that those schools that relied on a project-based approach, the students that were high attaining students appeared to have loved those. If you've got students that are perhaps less self-organized, less high attaining, then they missed the adult help. So it's, it's a blend of those two approaches that we're using with perhaps uh, a piece that's to camera that is captured and then sent to the students, which gives them an introduction which then leads to a task that the teacher can assess. Yeah, so that's kind of one of the bits we've kind of learned from the remote learning thus far, but there'll be more lessons to learn. Um, your other question was around electively home educating um, students. Um, as the law stands, if a, if a parent chooses to electively home educate, they take responsibility for the education of their child, uh, financial and the curriculum content. Um, our, our duty as a local authority is to assess whether the education is being provided efficiently and suitably. Um, and that's the piece of work we're engaging in. We have got uh, uh, an increase in families wanting to electively home educate. And Dave Harvey, who heads up that piece of work, is appointing some new additional um, ex-senior um, head teachers and deputies to start doing more of that work. We've got to respond to that quickly and get out to those families to assess the suitability of the education that they are providing to their children. So that, that's a piece of work that we're putting in place right now um, because it's clear that the numbers have uh, increased over the last over the first few weeks of term. Thank you. Councillor Bruce Tennant, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd like to also ask Brian uh, a question on testing. Uh, he said that it's averaging six positive ACD currently. So Brian, is have those people been tested positive, or they've just taken themselves out of the system uh, because they uh, exhibiting symptoms? No, those are all positive test results that I'm talking about. There are another group of people that are suspected cases, but the ones I've, I've given in the presentation are positive test results. So you said uh, averaging because of, you know, you said earlier that uh, there's a lag um, from getting the test to getting the results. So that's why you said averaging is... is... It, 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 was, it was about six for the first two weeks. Last week, after I'd written these slides, I've got to say it was more than that, and we were averaging... Um, to a day. Uh, over the weekend, just so you, you, we've had three new cases appear over the weekend, because obviously you don't get positive test results just on Monday to Friday. So we worked with three schools on Saturday and Sunday to make sure that they were um, in the right place um, for Monday morning this morning. So the so the tests that are being, being done are just the tests that, 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 that people can access from the government website. We haven't got a, a, a short circuit to, to this to get testing done more quickly. Every single school um, has got been given ten test result, ten tests that they can use. Um, so if a head teacher has a member of staff that is exhibiting the symptoms, they can give them one of those tests. They can take them home and they send those off to the lab to be analysed. Um, you're only allowed to have another ten tests every 21 days. So it's ten tests every 21 days. It is, yeah. Wow. Okay. Thanks very much, Brian. Thank you. Councillor Bill Withers, please. Brian, um, good morning to you. Talking about the welfare and the importance of the welfare of our professional staff um, and the number of tests we've just been talking about, and we're now into the autumn weather, has a consideration been taken into account to get our staff flu jabs? Um, do, you, do you want to talk about the corporate system, Steve, for all our staff? Or... Yeah, but so we've got um, uh, vouchers um, that are uh, going to be available for four flu jabs. Um, there is, uh, and there's a scheme in that's just coming online to, to, to get the distribution of those uh, out there. Um, I think uh, 
I'm, I'm still waiting on some further information about uh, about this and the uh, way in which schools can access that as well. Um, so it's not it's not settled yet. Yeah, yeah, and thank you for that. Uh, it's just with everything going on and your concern and our concern about the longevity of the COVID-19 crisis, um, it just seems prime that we cover both bases. Yeah, it is. There's, there's a... Um, I'm not... Uh, probably Simon Bryant would be the better person to answer this, but there's a, a prioritisation around the flu jabs, which is obviously you start with um, elderly people, you start with care homes, et cetera, et cetera. And um, then you get into um, NHS staff and then uh, frontline care staff. And, and so there's a there's a hierarchy. And um, it's fair to say we're trying to push various groups of people up the hierarchy, um, but we're not quite there yet. Okay. Bit of work in progress. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Jackie Branson, did you have a second question? Sorry, I, I don't think my is, is it still up? Yes. All right, I'll, I'll lower okay. it. No problem. Uh, back to you then, Steve. Okay, so we're back. Hopefully, um, back on the screen. Um, you can somebody give me the thumbs up that that's working. Yep, excellent. Okay, so the next section and final section is around. Um, uh, access resources and business development services. Suzanne's here and she's going to walk you through those with an emphasis on homeschool transport and early years. So over to you, Suzanne. Thank you. Uh, good morning, members. Um, so I'll talk to you first about homeschool transport and you'll be aware um, from various other things that I think you've seen and heard in other meetings that the PFE guidance that helped to inform us about exactly how we needed to approach organising transport for September was, was only issued uh, late in the day on, on the 11th of August, which gave us a really narrow window to arrange the transport for the um, 13,000 eligible children across Hampshire. Um, but what also came into play in that guidance was a need to uh, for, for us in the local authority to suppress demand on the public transport system and what that meant was that we needed to identify which um, young people attending college were using public transport and ensure that alternative means where necessary were put in place. That was particularly challenging because we don't hold a huge amount of information about how those young people travel. Um, so a, a huge amount of work needed to be done um, across the homeschool transport team, working with Brian's services directly into schools, and also with the um, environment, transport and economy part of the County Council to ensure that we were working across public transport and our commission services. We were given some additional funding by central government in recognition of the increased costs. The increased costs are incurred through a variety of different things, including um, laying on additional buses. So it, with those college students, for example, it may well be that we've put on additional transport. Um, we are, have some routes that are double running. So to try and support schools with staggered start and finish times, we've got dirt journeys that would normally be done once being done two or three times. Um, we've got enhanced cleaning going on on vehicles and a kind of wide variety of other, of other things. Um, and a kind of, kind of really overemphasize the complexity of the task that, that we were kind of faced with. Um, you may well be aware that there's different guidance for public transport versus what we call closed door contracts, so our, our commissioned homeschool transport. There isn't a requirement to socially distance on, on that transport because we know who's on it. They're children that are spending um, time together um, in any event um, and also um, other members of the public can't get onto those services. It's different on public transport um, because the, you know, who, who's on it is less well known and so social distancing does apply. And so again, we've got different sets of, um, of guidance applying in different scenarios. Where um, shortly after the guidance, we issued three sets of communications. So we, we sent through schools a set of FAQs to parents and we also published those on our website. We sent some guidance specifically to schools around how the, the principles we'd be applying to arranging the transport. And we sent a similar piece of guidance to our transport operators, setting out very clearly our expectations of them as we moved into organising all of the transport. Um, immediately upon 
publication of the guidance, we had daily meetings and we continued, um, you know, even through to this week, having those daily meetings because there was a need to constantly adapt uh, and adjust the transport that's in place. Um, for example, you know, as, as more people perhaps, not, not from last week's guidance, but we were seeing increases in the number of people on public transport, that means we have to flex our arrangements again for college students. Um, so, so every day we are kind of tweaking the system to make sure it's optimised um, and supporting that government guidance. Um, and I think we've been um, effective in being able to do that very rapidly and our transport operators have been very supportive um, in, and, and flexible in their approach with us. The new work we started in the last week or so, um, especially as cases have started to increase, is spot checking the risk, COVID risk assessments that our transport operators have, have undertaken. Um, because there isn't social distancing, there is a system of controls in place that includes things like um, hand sanitizer on board. Um, we recommend that face coverings are worn. Face coverings should be worn by the driver or screens need to be in place. We want vehicles to be well ventilated. So we're checking the risk assessments. And then for, we also have some inspectors through the ETE um, department who are actually going out and physically looking at transport arrangements to confirm that things are safe and as they've been described to us. And again, that will continue um, in the forthcoming weeks. Um, like we're working very, really closely with Brian as positive cases are identified because we obviously need to think about how did those children get to school and are there any implications back? Um, and there is some really close working going on there so that we can, again, adjust any transport arrangements um, so far. We haven't had a whole transport arrangement that, that's needed to be stopped, but we have, you know, we have, we have bubbles adjusting. Um, if you don't mind moving on, please, Steve, just to give you some facts and figures um, in terms of what, what we've organised. So we've got um, just under kind of 400 double runs operating to various different schools. Um, we offered all SEN eligible families a parental mileage allowance in place of, of commission transports. So this is where we we provide an allowance to pay for the, the kind of petrol um, for them to transport their own children and 221 parents took us up on that offer and for the autumn term are currently transporting their own children to school. We have 15 school special services in place so this is where um, there is a public bus route but behind that public bus will be a school special so it runs exactly the same route but it's specifically for the students. Um, we've supported colleges who often commission their own transport arrangements, um, so we've had to support them in ensuring that the guidance is adhered to and that, and that young people are getting to college but in a socially distanced way if they're on public transport. So we've used some of that £1.1 million DfE funding to support the colleges with the additional transport that's been required. Um, and we continue to work really closely with DfE and DFT to help them to understand the costs um, that are involved in this area. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's not always been something that they've necessarily been able to quantify well, and we've been doing a lot of work with them to help them understand the different implications um, and the costs that are incurred. So moving on to um, early years, um, it's quite a positive picture in early years. We didn't have any sufficiency issues over the summer, so um, children who needed to access childcare were able to. Um, we continue to provide the brokerage service for any families who are struggling, um, but actually the sectors responded really, really well to the September return, and we've got 99% of our group settings open. Um, I actually checked our attendance again last week, and it is very close to what we would normally expect have expected for this time of year pre-COVID, um, which is a real testament to the early years sector um, and the way that they've responded. Um, I think I spoke to you back in July around some of the measures we put in place during lockdown to help um, the early years settings financially, and we've continued to look to support them where we can. So we've made early payments of the autumn term funding to support cash flow where that's helpful to them. Um, and we're currently using um, some of the early years funding to develop an enhanced training and support offer to the early years sector around how they do kind of medium term business planning um, and financial planning. Uh, so we'll do that through a variety of means, including kind of online seminars, but also um, surgery options where we can meet with settings safely, but face to face to support them with, with individual kind of circumstances and issues that they might have. 
We have had a few closures um, over the summer holiday period, but that's normal for this sector. So eight settings closed over the summer. That's not unusual. You know, that's in line with previous years. Most of those closures we knew were on the cards, so they're not really as a direct result of COVID, albeit it might be that, you know, that, that was the kind of final straw for some of those operators. Um, in some cases, those settings will have been taken over by a new company. So not all of them are closures um, that result in a, in a loss of childcare places. Um, and where we have lost providers, we, we look very closely at whether or not there is still sufficient childcare in that area. And we have no concerns at the current time. I talked to you back in July about the fact that we have a model where we can kind of risk assess um, our providers. And we continue to do that and offer support to those who we feel are most vulnerable. The area that we continue to work hard at is around out of school childcare. Um, and there is still some tension um, in this area. Schools, understandably, have done a lot of work around their risk assessments, and it can be quite difficult for them to reconcile an external out of school club coming into the building and um, delivering services in a way that is different to, to the way the school have been operating in the day. There's also lots of additional kind of cleaning overheads and tasks that go along with that. So it is the case that there isn't as much out of school provision available as there normally would be. We are facilitating and brokering conversations between external providers and schools where, where it's helpful for us to do so. And we continue to offer support to that sector in terms of helping them where, they, where they've been unable to kind of identify um, a building to operate from. But it is an area that's still a bit of a challenge to us, um, particularly as, as the guidance drives those operators also sorry, drives those providers to um, support the bubbles within the school and things like that which is quite complex for the model that a number of our out of school providers run with um, I think that's probably it for me in terms of a, a, an update are there any questions that you you'd like to ask thanks Suzanne we've got councillor Jackie Porter first please Thank you. And uh, I think one thing I've got to say, Suzanne, is thank you, because I realised you had an incredibly difficult job uh, and two very stressful departments there to manage, or three. Um, and also thank you to all the staff for the whole children's services. You've done an amazing job uh, getting to this point. I don't think any of us realised it was going to go on this long. But I just wanted to raise two problems. Um, one is about children receiving bus passes. I've never had so many queries personally about children not receiving bus passes ready for starting back to school, as I did this time. Um, usually I perhaps get one, and I've had a lot this time. So really, how do you think we could manage this process better going forward so that children do receive their bus passes in time and perhaps working through the schools? Because I realised that you had a very short length of time. And uh, the second thing really is about uh, children in reception year, my understanding is that the vulnerable children haven't received their bus passes yet uh, and there's some delay to that. And I wondered if you can elaborate on how you're going to get that sorted out uh, in the next few weeks. I, I just, um, I know Suzanne will want to come in, but I, I, I can't, I can't shut myself up because the, the answer to the first question is um, to not have the guidance for the two weeks before we go back to school. Uh, that's, that's the real issue that underlies so much of this. Up, and, up until the 12th of August, we did not know how many buses we were setting up, how many, um, how many taxis, how many uh, escorts were going to need it. We were, we were not sighted on what it was that we needed to do. And uh, I know that you know this, Jackie, but other members of the committee might not. Um, you know, I, I wrote, um, personally, I, I wrote through our professional association, um, the, assistant, uh, the Association of Directors of Children's Services, Suzanne wrote to the uh, Department of Education saying we need the guidance. And we were promised the guidance and it did not appear until uh, effectively the 12th of August. That is too late. That, that underlies the whole range of issues around getting routes finalised, getting bus passes out and so on. So that is why your inbox and indeed mine is full of issues around bus passes uh, this year and and it hasn't been the previous year there's that's it's an obvious connection to make but I'm gonna I'm gonna make it um, it's really hampered uh, uh, our preparations so 
that was notwithstanding that there probably are lessons that you know in this in spirit that we've talked about earlier about well how can we try and do this differently and how can we make it smoother in the future there are probably some things that we can we can pick up so um suzanne do you want to just elaborate a bit more from there you're on mute suzanne thank you <laughs> um there were a number of transport arrangements that because of the late guidance were firmed up late in the day much much later than we would have liked and that than we would normally put in place and that did mean that bus passes went out late parents were written to as were schools to say there will be no issues with not having a pass and getting on the bus and all the operators have been told in no uncertain terms to accept children whether they had last year's bus pass or whether they were just saying that they were supposed to be on the bus that they were, they were to get on um, we we've got a few outstanding issues but the bulk have now been resolved um, I think it would be fair to say that the team have been working on a kind of just in time basis because of and we, we're just starting to come out the other side in terms of the number of adjustments we're making every day is decreasing um, and so that frees up capacity for us to start thinking about some of the other things that we would normally do, like the issuing of the UR bus passes, like the selling of privileged seats, um, where we have those spare seats. And those are, so those are things we would normally be doing at this time, of, or we would have done by now. Um, but because we have been needing all of our capacity to make sure that the, um, the arrangements that we've got in place are effective, we're only just getting to those things now. But I'd hope that we clear the bulk of, of those kind of late actions and the correspondence in the next week or two. Thank, um, thank you, Suzanne, that's really helpful because uh, I think that those parents have sort of been told a date, but they're never quite sure whether that's real or whether that's not. And if you're trying to get a child to school two or three miles away, I think that's a serious problem. And, and the question really, I suppose, is, Yes, it's fine to say your child will get on the bus, but if it's a community that has three buses or two buses or five buses to that same community, the children are standing there not sure whether how many buses are coming. And I think that has added to the challenge of it. Um, the children don't know whether to ring mum and say, help, I'm still stuck at the bus stop or there's another one following on. Mm -hmm. So um, have you, have you found, found a way of dealing with that problem? Yep, so for those schools um, who have a number of buses that run on similar routes and what we have planned the loading in such a way as the buses aren't, aren't over capacity, um, so if the kids get on the wrong bus it can cause problems, we wrote to all of those schools and those families to reconfirm which bus their child should be getting on. For a very small number, as we adjusted things um, in, in some schools, they were asked to, you know, five or six families might be asked to change to a different bus. That's all part of what we would normally do to kind of um, assess the loading and adjust the loading and make sure it's safe. But for those schools with big a, a number of transport arrangements, we have done that reconfirmation. Thank you. I just um, wanted to apologise to the other members for continuing to ask these questions. But obviously, um, as the councillor whose area in which the accident happened, I I wanted to know whether it was a one or four, whether that's an issue right across the whole board. And it sounds as if it's a, it's been a challenge right everywhere. Thank you. No problem. Thanks, Jackie. Councillor Anne Briggs. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my question is children with disabilities that go to school in the taxi. And I see you're, we're now giving parents mileage so they can get children to school. But what happens to the children that parents can't take to school? Because in a taxi, they normally have to have a carer with them, which with COVID, I'm just wondering how you're managing with that. Um, so parental mileage allowances are, are optional. Parents don't have to take them. And if they choose not to take one, then we must and do provide the transport for those, ch for those children. Um, and if they need a passenger assistant or a school escort to be with them on the journey, then we continue to provide um, th those services. We have we envisage that we might have some problems around school escorts um, if we were splitting journeys up. But actually, our, our kind of escort workforce have been fantastic in their um, oh, and really committed actually to the children that, that they travel with. Um, we've got 
you know, children with some um, quite severe issues. We've got children who have uncontrollable spitting um, and those escorts have continued to support those journeys. So it's a problem that we anticipated, but that thankfully didn't didn't come to fruition. Um, and those those arrangements for those families for children with disabilities are in place. Thank you. And Councillor Malcolm Wade, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. But Councillor Briggs has asked the very question that I was going to ask. So uh, you know, there's no need. I'll put my hand down. Great. There we go. We've reached the end of our questions. Unless we've got any last minute takers. Okay. Steve, happy for us to move to the recommendation? Absolutely. And, and just to say thank you for the comments and questions. It's been really, certainly from my perspective, really, really helpful debate and really useful discussion. And would you be able to pass on our committee's thanks to all of the staff in the Children and Young People Services through education, care and the business development side of things, just to say thank you for what they're doing during the, this pandemic? Because I think, as we've heard today, it is really vital work and it's as you are extremely busy we'd just like our this committee's thanks to be known yeah thank you very much well I'll pass on. great so the recommendation members is that the children and young people select committee note the update provided in the presentation so um, if we are all agreed and I can take that by a show of hands yes and nodding then we shall move agreed. on agreed agreed super Thank you very much. We will move on to item seven, which is our autism assessment services update presentation from Matthew Powell, the associate director, Isle of Wight and designated clinical officer for SEND. Apologies for the mouthful of the title, Kirsten. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Thank you very much, councillors. I appreciate this uh, chance to bring this presentation to you. I'd like to frame it in advance if I can. Um, I can actually pull it up. My team took over the commissioning of autism in July from the CAMS team. And as such, we discovered it was in a fairly parlous state. I apologise, Jackie, would there any chance it can be brought up? Because I don't have the option to do so. Oh, let me. Um... Is it easier if I if I do it for people? I think I've got it. I've yes, because made... I'm an attendee, I can't share I've... content. Yes, yeah. okay. Just made... just bear with me one second. I'll I'll bring it up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Steve. One thing I wanted to do for all councillors was to give a very honest and transparent view of the service as it is, because I don't believe in making things out to be different from what they are. I think for you to actually see the service as it is would be advantageous. We did a very quick deep dive into the service when I took it over because we realised it wasn't a fair degree of a pile of state and as such when the slides come up we'll be able to see where we're at. Should just be coming up now with a bit of luck. Yes, thank you, Steve. So if we can move to the second slide, the autism pathway. So obviously we realised there was a significant delay and on doing the deep dive, we discovered that there was a waiting list of around 1,750 assessments outstanding across Hampshire with a mean waiting time of near on three years. Waiting lists are obviously significantly outside the National Institute of Clinical Excellence guidance of 13 weeks from referral. And on top of this growing waiting list, there's an average of 90 children that are referred in each month in Hampshire and 30 on the Isle of Wight, which equates to over 1,068 children per year. Now, historically, piecemeal investment over the last two years has poorly managed this waiting list with a total of circa about 50 assessments a month, which equates to 602 per annum. And the thing to note is that there's no recognised treatment pathway following a diagnosis of autism in the NHS. However, 
early identification of needs and corresponding support will provide richer evidence towards that diagnosis, but also rules out other treatable conditions before a lifelong diagnosis of autism is obtained. And one of the big things that we discovered that there is a significant culture shift that needs to occur both in schools and in society that moves away from being the reliance on a diagnosis. Every child is open to having a diagnosis, but some may not need them until later on in life, particularly for post-16 education. Um, and we need to focus on some of the interventions that we have looked at, such as sensory support, emotional regulation and anxiety management, because if we do them early enough, the children get the greatest gains out of them. And once those interventions have been provided, a diagnosis can then be sought, and then it's useful to both the families and the individuals. We go to the next slide, please, Steve. So brief history from your last update, which I believe was November last year. Um, in 2018, a decision was made by the Five Hampshire CCGs to transfer 824 children that were waiting for an autism assessment from the CAM service, the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service, to an interim service to clear the backlog. 989,000 was identified over that 10 month contract. The difficulty there was that actually these children never rise to the top of the CAMS waiting list because they're not deemed clinically worrisome enough to have immediate intervention. And there are often other pro processes that come first within the CAMS service and actually need more focus for children that have got suicidal ideation, et cetera, et cetera. So the decision was taken part of a wider CAMS improvement plan, but it would it was recognised that it would not generate additional capacity. Instead, it would guarantee that these cohort of children would at least be seen after waiting a number of years. Then in 2019, a deep dive was performed by my previous deputy director and the CAMS associate director and presented for investment. This investment wasn't agreed at the time due to competing demands. We then had PERDA relating to the general elections. Subsequently, the impact of COVID-19 has further disrupted any commissioning plans. So consequently, ASC diagnosis commissioning has been maintained at similar levels to 2019 to 2020 during this year, and a plan to address longer term needs is under development. We also need to look at longer term procurement for ASC assessments to prevent further delay and future proof the service. Next slide, please, Steve. Can we have the next slide, please, Steve? Ah, there it is, thank you. So since no November 2019, when we last spoke to you, we've had significant changes in senior management leadership, which interrupted the procurement planning, um, meaning that short-term commissioning arrangements for autism assessments needed to be extended. The lockdown also introduced a further level of complexity because to actually carry out an autism assessment, you normally need to be in the same room as the child. Um, it normally involves two practitioners, one observing the child, the other taking notes. And we had to then come up with face-to-face, non-face-to-face methodologies that needed to be tested before they could be incorporated in service specs as part of the future-proofing commissioning intentions. So we then took the decision to directly award autism activity for Hampshire to two providers who could do non-face-to-face -face assessments for 12 months with the option of a further 12-month exemption, should this prove necessary. And as I've already discussed, we took over paediatric commissioning as a SEN team, because it was felt to better fit the SEN team portfolio than the CAMS portfolio. In July, we performed a rapid deep dive and diagnostic and have started working up the solution to offer a timely assessment while also tackling a historic waiting list. We, array, we managed to secure additional funding to complete 250 assessments over a two month period in July. That commenced August and is due to come to fruition at the end of this month. And I can happily say that that has been completed. And we're now working with our CCG finance colleagues and providers to reprofile the activity for the second half of 2020 to 21. 
The difficulty has been the release of national treasury funding has led to severe commissioning budget uncertainty and therefore all our commissioning intentions have had to be put on hold whilst we get the financial guidance from the national treasury. So we have an options paper ready we are developing and we are seeking to clarify the commissioning intention the budgets for 21 22 and beyond next slide please Steve. so i have classed this as next steps in addressing a wicked issue and the wicked uh, councillor bolton quite rightly pointed out to me wicked refers to the issue in hand about how we solve this crisis it is there are various different models that we could look at and most are prohibitively expensive we're talking several millions pounds to be able to set up a solu a quick solution and require a significant lead time to impact upon the waiting list we've discussed so what we are proposing to do is reduce and eliminate autism assessment waiting list through enhanced levels of commissioning for act assessment activity for a defined period of time following agreement of the funding regime engaging with the current provider to perform a rapid assessment and triage of the existing waiting list for harm and escalate those cases accordingly and reprioritize the waiting list when necessary clarify support and referral pathways to ensure the right sizing of commissioning arrangements for autism as part of a more joined up pathway to prevent recurrence for a waiting list in future and what we've taken is the view of that has been developed of a system in st helens up in up in merseyside where they actually look to provide intervention before diagnosis and there is a full range of services which i'll discuss in my next slide but it requires this multifaceted phased approach on early intervention and the key of this has to keep be keeping the child and young person central in the process so these appropriate support mechanisms need to be commissioned which look at sensory support emotional anxiety emotional regulation and anxiety management we know also need to look at working with partners such as our hampshire county council primary behavior service to provide behavioral support and also looking at our third sector partnerships such as autism hampshire etc cetera, etc cetera. and when necessary look at other support to help those with autism and other neurodevelopmental developmental diversity to understand their own differences the impact of them of them on their lives and approaches there's nothing worse as an autistic child feel it in feeling that you're different to everybody else there almost needs to be they need to be given an answer as to why they are different and how they, we can make this difference work for them what we have done with this approach is already trial it on the isle of wight um we went albeit it was small numbers we had an 80 percent reduction in the number of children requiring diagnosis after we had put these interventions preventative work in place now obviously that number may not extrapolate in the same manner to hampshire but i'm confident we can significantly reduce the required the children requiring a diagnostic substantially to make this work so as we've already discussed we need to reduce the waiting list by agreeing the funding regime for an investment to save and we're looking at a significant number of assessments we're looking at completing 1600 assessments in hampshire to be completed in the next year followed by commissioning of about 700 assessments forward to reduce further reduce the backlog in the next two years we need to raise the awareness and cultural change develop cultural change by working on a preventative agenda and we need to work with our professionals in education social care schools colleges about how we can best support these children and young people to develop an improved knowledge and understanding of autism in society and how it impacts upon the lives of children and young people we also want to, to enhance the commissioned offer both support services including those on the waiting list so that interventions can be accessed prior to assessment previously you always had to have a diagnosis to be able to access the support services but we need to change that on its head to change the culture and that will also then provide support to families and children and young people whilst they're awaiting a diagnostic and as we have already alluded to may also eliminate the need for further diagnostic testing 
And then in, finally, we need to reserve the longer term and funding and future proofing of the service so that we don't get into this situation again. And again, I've discussed this at length already, but appropriate intervention as early as possible is the best possible solution to this. If continuing to invest in an assessment only service will only continue to promote a culture of parents seeking diagnosis rather than support. And there is significant numbers that are being put forward through for ASC diagnostics that may have other disorders and therefore we are at risk of misdiagnosing some of these children. So we're looking at an investment to resolve this and then the services we intend to commission are listed below but the biggest one being the well-being and support of uh, social emotional mental health working with our partners in Hampshire County Council around the primary behaviour service. This also meets the CCG actions in the light of the recent CQC and Ofsted send inspection and the designated clinical officer work plan. The other big one that we want to work with is family support and diagnostic peer support. So actually we can reach out to these families, put them in touch with each other, and we can utilize a network of people to actually begin to support people prior to diagnostics. But then the biggest one, and it's always going to be the most difficult, is cultural change. Di understanding that a diagnosis is not required in order to receive SEND support or an EHCP is huge, and that needs to change drastically in order for this model to work, and that we will aim to carry out through the DCO work plan, working with our partners in education, social care, and with our third sector. So thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Councillor Councillor Palpair, Palpair, was first. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm really concerned about this 35-month uh, wait, which is obviously almost three years. Um, what happens to children who are waiting um, to be diagnosed and then they go into adulthood? Um, will they then go on the waiting list or in, in, in the adult waiting list? So if they are approaching adulthood, so they're approaching 18, we automatically push them to the top of that list, try and push them through as soon as possible. So they are not double listed in effect as to what you're alluding to, because there's nothing worse than sit, being sat on a waiting list for three years, you hit 18 and then you've got to reach the, go and sit on the adult waiting list. We can't do that. So we're actually actively looking at them in terms of dates of birth as well, to make sure that they are prioritised for ASC diagnostics. Thank you. No problem. Councillor Jackie Porter. Perhaps we've lost her. Councillor Frank Arbiter. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, obviously, um, you know, this is a huge number of children waiting on a list. But I'm really interested to hear that you're moving away from this diagnostic um, approach. And I just wonder what approach can, can be taken and whether you've got, had any thoughts about this yet uh, as how you can encourage concerned parents um, to move away from thinking that diagnosis of autism is the most important action that can be taken. Um, for their child, especially young children. Um, you know, is this going to involve sort of a large culture change for schools and GPs? And, and you know, that's a, that's a big thing to try and change. I just wonder how that's, how that's going to be approached. It is a huge thing to change, and you're quite right in alluding to it. I don't think we have so much of an issue with the education teams as much as we do with GPs and some of our other parties. Teachers are more on board with the idea that actually if we can reach out to these children and provide the appropriate supports to them, they can achieve far more, far quicker in education than they will anything else. The difficulty is the pathway post-diagnosis is very difficult within the NHS. Most of it is societal or environmental changes to that child's environment for the elder them to learn. So the difficulty then comes is how do you change, how do you shift a culture? And as you well know, that takes time. It's not going to happen overnight, and I'm very aware of that. But to actually reduce the, the reliance on a diagnosis 
will be huge and actually have hu reap huge benefits for these children. It's something that we're determined to do. And yes, it is going to be an uphill struggle. I'll completely admit that, but it has to happen. We cannot have a list this size with children waiting this long for time. It's an interesting, can I just come in for a minute? And it's something that really interests me in a in a strange way, which is the, the way in which as a society, we've created a, a medical category around autism for which we have no cure. <laughs> and um, so what but what we have is a, a series of um, adjustments and um, uh, techniques that can help make a young person's life and their families better. Um, it's a. It, it, I, I just think it's really interesting the way that we've we've ended up in this um, in this place, and I and I don't know. Um, for example, we didn't have this many children with uh, we we didn't seem to have this many children uh, five years ago or or ten years ago. So what is it that's changed in our society that means that people are are more keen to seek a diagnosis? Um, and what does that what does that seem to give them or what do they perceive that that gives them? So I don't know that those, those, there are answers to those questions, but I just think it's a really there interesting. There aren't necessarily answers, but I think to pe paint that in a different light, the problem was the access to the resources required needed the diagnosis. And therefore it was the wrong, wrong way around. It was the incentive was in the wrong place. Yeah. So essentially, if we shift the incentive to the interventional and preventative measures, in theory, you don't need the diagnosis. Though every child has a right to a diagnosis and we're not taking that away, if you ch change the focus, you can make lives for those, those children that much better by putting in the appropriate support mechanisms. Yeah. I think Councillor Jackie Porter is back with us, so we will go to her next if she is. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Just as it turned, it just said that I've got no internet. It killed it. So I've got a different device. So, um, no, and so I'm, I'm sorry if these questions have been taken before. So the first one is um, Councillor Bolton mentioned about Wicked. I'm not sure if it's very cool or very bad. Um, uh, I'm not sure why we're using it to describe the issue, but we'll, I gather that Councillor Bolton's moved on from that. So the two or three things I want to raise is that you talked about autism. You're not needing a diagnosis but you haven't mentioned a really key one of housing. Um, I'm also a local authority um, councillor, and um, you'll be aware that children under 10 cannot have their own bedroom. Uh, and if they have autism, sharing a room with somebody else is very hard. Uh, there's also the, the, I'm gonna call it the bedroom tax for sim yeah. simplicity. Um, so actually parents do need that uh, designation um, of autism in order to help them get to a point where they can have a room for that child. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and it can bring on sibling mental health issues, which means about young carers, family relationships, parenting, domestic violence, potential death, death issues with police. So I, I understand what you said about you're not needing it for education and health, but there are lots of other aspects to your life. You can't go to scout with somebody else unless you've got a diagnosis. So um, I'm just saying that you know, there is the most fundamental of those is, ha is a home, and that puts the pressure on it. So I really want to see this work happen. I'm really pleased that it's been taken in. Um, my organisation that potentially has the funding to do it. Um, and so my question to you really is, are we, I'm following really Steve's question, are we doing any research about why pretty much one in 30 children seems to have this issue nowadays at least? And what is the best form of ongoing support for those children? Is that being done in the NHS? Or is that being done in psychology? Or the, where uh, is there is done? a national party across England that's looking at it, and there is a national working party across the south of England that is looking at framing an autism pathway for all children. Mm -hmm. So in answer to your question, yes, the background work will be being done at a national level, and we are involved in that 
in a light touch. We are not involved per se as a CCG, but obviously they are in liaison with providers and schools, et cetera, et cetera. And I think one of the biggest issues is that schools are getting much, much better at picking these children up. And I think that gives rise to actually, yes, OK, we'll refer them for a diagnosis. Are they fully autistic? Are they just a little bit different? There's a lot of di there's Everybody's on a spectrum to a certain extent. It's how far and where you are on that spectrum as to whether you need a diagnosis of autism. And I completely get your point about a diagnostic being required for housing. Don't, don't get me wrong. And I'm not here to take away diagnosis from children. Every child has a right to a diagnosis. What we're saying is actually let's put some of the interventions in before the diagnosis to better support them in their environment so that we can get the diagnosis done at the right time for them. You're just on mute, Jackie. As a result, I'm asking to make a recommendation to this committee because actually, to be honest, I think most of this committee would be quite disappointed that we had hope, great hopes of last year um, and listening to what was hopefully going to come forward with nearly a million pounds of support to get us speedily up. Uh, and it's encouraging to see it being taken over by a different commissioner, but we really must see that. So my recommendation is that this scrutiny committee receives a report, not necessarily a, not necessarily a full presentation like this, but a, pre a report on the progress of this for every single scrutiny committee for us to be able to ask questions about should we wish to. So uh, I, put that in the, I put that in the chat yep. because I think it's so vital for one thing, so many aspects of our children's lives. One thing that would really benefit me, and if I may ask, is if I could ask the select committee to write in support of the plan to the CCG and whether that would be a possible action that could be taken out of this meeting. Um, so I'm very that... comfortable to recommend that I write on behalf of the committee to the five Hampshire CCGs, um, encouraging them to commission this model so that we can hopefully see the results that have been seen in the Isle of Wight here in Hampshire. And by, of course, by next April, it'll be one Hampshire CCG. And um, so, you know, I'm very conscious that the reorganisation of the CCG can also create delay in the system. So my personal, well, my recommendation to this committee is that we do seek to actively work through this literally at every meeting, not necessarily a full presentation, but certainly a report on which we could ask questions. The advantage of where how we work already is we are already in the shadow form as one CCG for the children's partnership. So on a children's level, we already commission as one CCG. So in theory, we can take that forward to our uh, performance and governance board and then to our children's exec committee as well very quickly. So if I could make that amendment to the recommendation. Do you have a... Um, oh, Chairman, it's Jack. It, I'll Jackie, second sorry, that. Sorry to interrupt. Can we need um, additional recommendations to after or oh, questions? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, is that OK? Then we can put them in the chat and... Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll move to Robert Sanders with his question then next, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was interested. Uh, my question's partly been answered by your positive comments about the work of education um, and school professionals. Um, but equally, obviously, there's a significant reduction on the Isle of Wight. Um, and I wondered whether you could just explain what contribution training in schools has um, made towards that reduction and whether or not that's a realistic aim to um, spread across the rest of Hampshire and you know to what extent do you think um, a better educated workforce in schools is, is having on reducing the um, requirement for diagnosis? Very difficult to give an exact percentage as you can probably imagine I think one of the biggest things that we did do on the Isle of Wight was actually get our OT colleagues to reach out to provide social and emotional mental health training to colleagues in the schools so that they could better understand the needs of these children. And therefore that had a massive impact because actually you got better school engagement in the whole process. And therefore allowances were given to allow these children to better function within that environment. So I have significant confidence, it, albeit I don't believe we will get to an 80% reduction, we will get to, a, I think we will get to an over 50% reduction in that waiting list 
through better usage of appropriate interventions. Were there extra training events? Yes, so our OTs did reach out and provide training within schools. We also have mental health support teams working in schools as well, and they will they are forming a link uh, development across Hampshire with a number of schools to actually better support these children in school as well. So there is constant rollout of additional training to education as well to support this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Malcolm Wade, please. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairman, uh, and, and thank you for, for that uh, presentation. It's, it's a very challenging topic, uh, and uh, uh, please forgive me if I've missed something you've got in next. I want to just talk a bit about the figures for a minute, yes. and then I'm going to make a point. Uh, we have a 1,750 backlog, yeah. and we have 1,068 on average every year increase yes. in it. So you're proposing to do 1,600 assessments in 21-22 and a further 708 year on year after that. They're not additional, that's the core. No, 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 core. they would be additional. They so, will be additional. Yes. So if we have it, so how many, could you remind me, how many do we do normally? In year? So 600? normally it's just over 600. Here's 600, I thought. So by, by, Doing the normal ones and that one, you'll get over the backlog in two years. It's what we're looking at. The difficulty is the financial framework around this because there is so many other competing demands for the money. And that's what I've got to make a very strong case for, which is why I was seeking support from the select committee for this. Well, I think that's... that's a, so I, I get the plan on the figures, but it all depends on, on funding. I of course that. it does, yeah. Um, the one point that I think may well would have been made, that I think it is it would be cognizant, is that parents don't always agree with what organisations and experts say. And no. Fundamentally, uh, we're in a, a period where we are more enlightened to children's conditions. Uh, and, and in the current situation that we're in, I suspect the problem will get worse, not less. Right, uh, and, and we need to... to to, to I agree, support what you want to do. Uh, and I also would support Councillor Porter's request for a more an update. Because we to get on top of this, you need to take decisive action. And there's going to be a lot of priorities challenging for this funding. Because we don't want to end up arranging the deck chairs on the Titanic no. as we hit the iceberg. Because Completely. without that, you're not going to get anywhere. Completely. Okay. So I, I understand exactly what the plan is now. And, and I wish you luck with that. Thank you, Chairman. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Jackie Branson, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the, some of these children on the extremes are finding very difficult for their, you know, their parents find very difficult to get them to school because of, you know, the, the problems that they have. And some are home homeschooling. I just wonder how much support we give for that. At present, the health service is only commissioned to uh, provide diagnostics and that's the difficulty what a lot and that is the biggest problem with this whole model is that it is purely yes your child has autism we then leave you almost dry, hanging and dry to try and sort out what support measures are available and that is when the reliance on the third sex comes in so i think there is a greater need to actually look at these interventions in advance which is the whole plan behind this model, so that they can have support prior to a diagnosis. Thank you. Councillor Bill Withers. Matthew, thank you for your presentation. Um, I sit on the Surrey and Borders Partnership NHS uh, Mental Health Trust, and we've had several um, presentations on the autism spectrum. One of the things that uh, is not obvious to everybody is that the later a diagnosis is made that individual may have had several me uh, different um, medical medications during its its life to date and that does have a serious detrimental effect on that individual uh, later in life and i fully support what you're trying to do because the earlier we identify um, that a child has a sort of autism um, the better for that individual but also the better for the parents because um, as has just been said 
many a relationship has broken up mm. over you know the uh, the lack of uh, diagnostic of a child with autism and and of course uh, one parent blames the other um, and the the more pub, uh, publicity we can give the spectrum uh, the better so anything we can do um, in the in the future is very important what relationship do you have with the um, Surrey Borders? Um, Funny enough, I am in liaison with all of our partner agencies to look at their modelling as we speak to see what they have done around this issue because it is a national issue and the waiting times are similar for a lot of areas nationally. There is a a significant delay across the board. It is not just Hampshire. And I think one of the things that we've got to look at, as well as we are one of the biggest area uh, Hampshire County Council is one of the biggest council areas and I would bet I would love to be able to say in three years time we've actually cracked this and be able to uphold it as a national a shining national example of how we can do it yeah I'm sure I'm sure Steve would agree yeah <laughs> any help we can give you know the county councillors that are working on that group as well um we'd be delighted to uh, thanks very uh, much I appreciate it. that Councillor Wills Okay, I think we've come to the end of questions, unless anyone else has a question they would like to raise. No, okay, in which case we will tackle these recommendations. So I am very happy, as uh, Matthew has requested, um, to write on behalf of the committee to the CCGs asking them to fund and commission this the preventative model that has um, been working on the Isle of Wight and say that we would like to see it in Hampshire if I um, can have a seconder to that recommendation. I'm and happy to second that. Chairman, would you be able to just um, populate that in the chat just so we can be all clear just off the wording, would that be okay? That's absolutely Thank fine. Bear with me. There you go, something along those lines. Thank you. Would you like me to read that out, Councillor North? Yes, and let me know if you're content with the exact wording. So the additional recommendation is that the Children and Young People Select Committee recommend that the Chairman of the Committee writes to the five Hampshire CCGs asking them to commission a preventative model of funding for autism assessments as has been tested on the Isle of Wight here in Hampshire. And that's proposed by Councillor North and sorry, I missed a seconder. I think there were a few, but Fran has got her uh, hand up. So Councillor Fran Carpenter. Carpenter, second. Thank you. Shall we do a, a show of hands for this? Um, this will exclude the co-optees um, from this particular item for voting. Does anyone abstain to this additional recommendation? Oh, sorry, Councillor Carpenter, do you abstain? 
I think the, our hands were in the support, hands. but they've come down. Oh, OK. <laughs> so if anyone abstains, then please unmute and shout now. Um, no, no abstentions. Um, does anyone disagree with this additional recommendation? So if there's anyone disagree, then please shout. And can I conclude that everyone is in agreement with the additional recommendation? So yes. hands up and verbalise. Agree. Thank Agreed. you. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Yeah, agree. So that additional recommendation is carried. Thank you, members. Thank you. So, Councillor Jackie Porter, would you like to um, remind us of your recommendation? Yeah, hold on. I put it in the chat much earlier, but I'd like to propose an amendment to the autism paper recommendation. So I'd like to recommend that the scrutiny receive a report for every meeting until we're satisfied that the service has caught up and is providing a good service to children, parents and schools. I second that, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Wade. Can I ask perhaps that the report that we receive is in writing? Very so as not to impact reason. on the um, future agenda, because we've got quite a few items coming yes. up. Very, very happy to do so, but with the opportunity for us then to at least uh, ask questions back to uh, Matthew about them or to Children's Services, because this, uh, this has been going on for absolute years and I think we owe it to previous members of the committees as well as ourselves to, to continue to support the service but also to challenge it too. Okay, so perhaps we can add just the in writing into the um, text of that, Jackie. Yeah. Uh, what I'll do, Chairman, is I will, um, Councillor Porter, would it be possible um, just to have some additional clarification around um, providing the good service to children, parents and schools? Just a bit of clarification around that so it's clear to the CCGs what the scrutiny con committee consider they need to achieve? Yes. Um, do you want me to put that in writing on the chat or do you want me to say it now? I think okay. what we're, we're asking, okay, I think it's a timely service, isn't it, really? A, a timely service and a reactive service. Um, and I haven't included um, housing providers, but actually I think that is one of the challenges that we can set up in a different form. Um, so I think it's about providing a timely service as well as providing a service that's relevant to the, relevant to the children and the schools and the parents, as well as a service that is not um, taking three years to get a diagnosis. Okay. Let me, um, what I'll do Do you want me to do a new chat? Do you want me to write a new chat? Do you mind? And then I can read that out for, so oh, it's for clarity. Thank you. Just, just some clarity as well around um, perhaps because of the capacity on the agendas, um, just a report being circulated yeah, to members rather than, thank you. Um, sorry, it's just, just died on me, so I'll just start again. <laughs> happy if I take Councillor Fran Carpenter's question. Please do. Go for it, Fran. Yeah, it's really just a comment, really. I, I'm, I'm just concerned that we don't, I don't, we shouldn't take away uh, Matthew, Mr Powell's time uh, for a report every uh, meeting. I just wondered if we need to do it for every meeting, but I'll, I'll wait and hear, you know, see the, the full uh, recommendation. But uh, I'd rather they got on with the actual work we not have to write reports for us too often. Yeah, 
I could just say something, no, Chairman. Would it be possible to come in again? Yes. Um, I wondered if we could hear, what, you know, whether Mr. Powell himself thinks it's something that would be achievable, and whether he'd be happy to do it. In that case, you know, I would be happy, but I don't want to overload him. I appreciate the comment, Councillor Carpenter. I think the difficulty is this is not going to be a quick fix. We're looking at a two or three year plan, so I don't want to overwhelm the committee with onerous reports either that you have to read. Can we suggest six monthly as a, or would you want more, more frequent data than that? I mean, as far as I, I, I'm concerned, are you talking to me, Miss Bell, or I'm the chair? To, I'm talking to sorry. you in general, sorry. <laughs> I didn't want to butt in if you were talking to the chairman. Um, I mean, you know, every other meeting or something like that and a brief report would be my my view, but that's just my personal view and I don't know what the others think. So I'll wait and hear from maybe from other people. Okay, that's now in the chat for everyone. Um, just draw that your attention to that. Shall I read that out, Chairman? So an additional recommendation, a second one, is to recommend that the Children and Young People Select Committee receives a written report for every meeting until we are satisfied that the service has caught up and is providing a timely service for children, parents and schools and proof that the service is making progress. So would that, would that be a, a written report? So just to clarify, that is circulated around rather than actually coming to the meeting, just sort of bearing in mind the, the pressures on the on the other meetings with the heavy, quite heavy agendas. Yes, we receive reports of several hundred pages for things, and if people are interested, satisfied that they they're making good progress, and that's fine. But if there isn't, it is an opportunity for us to to check up that there is progress and that the grants that we're all hoping were going to be passed on or commissioning services did that were actually delivered, and that we weren't waiting another potentially six months to find out that that wasn't happening because I think uh, Matthew's enthusiasm is really well received but we need to make sure that that is actually happening. Okay. I think we were most depressed last year and this feels like Groundhog Day again I'm afraid for a variety of reasons that are not necessarily in their own control but it's something that we know is something that's very serious for our, many of our parents and children. And schools. Okay, do we have a seconder for that recommendation? Uh, sure. Councillor Wade. Yeah. 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 Wade. Okay, so can I ask members? Um, again, this precludes, this doesn't include the co optees. Does anyone abstain from, from this recommendation? I've got one abstention. Does anyone disagree with the recommendation? Yeah, I'd like to disagree because I think it's too regular, but um, if I can, please. And I know I would like to um, second Councillor um, uh, Carpenter on that as well. I, it's it's going to be all too much. Every meeting, we're going to have a report from these people, um, from this uh, Mr. Matthews. Uh, I know, I think it's all too much. Um, I would go for at least six months and then if we have that same feeling come back again that we're still not happy, then, we, then we'll, we'll have a report every, at every meeting. But until then, I think we should give Mr Matthews, it's Mr Matthews, isn't it? Yeah, give Mr, Ma Powell. Mr. Powell. Matthew Powell's. Powell's, yeah. Powell. I'd like to give uh, Mr Powell's um, <coughs> um, uh, 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 another um, uh, look at this, what he's doing, the work he's doing, because... He only took this over in July, I believe, did he? In July, August, September, October. We haven't given him enough time, I don't think. I think we should give him another six months and then see how it all goes. Thank you. I'd be happy to support that idea as well. 
Um, I agree also. Thank you. Okay, so can I just does, have a... Sorry. Do we need to take Jeff and Porter's recommendation as it is sure, before sure. then taking another sure, recommendation, sure. changing the time? Sorry, I'm just asking Jackie Taylor for some clarity. But yes, Malcolm Wade, you can go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Truman. We all realise, members, that this my analogy of mentioned about the Titanic earlier is very true. This is a gigantic problem that is only getting worse year on year. And we have a duty to the parents and to the children in our county to keep our, our eye on the ball. Because out of sight, out of mind. If it wasn't so serious, I would agree. Six months, not nine months, so forth. But this is a serious problem. Matthew has shown a great amount of, it, of enthusiasm for this. And it's right that we as a, a committee show our support for what he's trying to achieve by wanting an update to see how he's doing, to see if we have to write more letters or we have to canvas any more direction to try and support him in this. Because the problem won't go away without the funding and we need to have our eye on the ball and be aware of it in a timely manner. Six months is another uh, 500 children going on the waiting list. We need to think about this. And I actually think keep our eye on the ball, keep the focus strong, because that way we can then make, try and make as give as much support as we possibly can. But if we don't know, we can't. Chairman. So I, I, I think we should follow the original recommendation, uh, uh, original recommendation of Council Porter. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't quite catch how many people um, were against the recommendation. Can I have a show of hands, please? I had what had zero members abstaining. Can I ask how many people disagree, please? By way of a show of hands, clicking on the hands, please. Oops, that was an accident. Sorry. One, two, three. I'm trying to count. I have seven. Seven disagree. Okay, and can those people put their hands down? Can I have a show of hands for those who agree with the additional recommendation? Please keep your hands up whilst I count, please. I have eight. Eight who agree. So that's the majority of members. That recommendation is carried. OK, thank you, Jackie. So if we can take the original recommendation on the item seven. Um, first, which is that the Children and Young People Select Committee receive and note the overview provided in the presentation. You can see hands going up. Content with that, Jackie? Uh, yeah. Lovely, thank you. And do we need to go over our, rec our additional recommendations again, or are we happy? Well, I just um, wanted to double check because I wanted just to double check. Um, I think one of the co optees might have voted on Councillor Porter's additional recommendation, so I might have to <laughs> redo that one again. I apologise, the co optees are not able to vote. On the um, on the autism um, update, so I okay. believe that would take one out. Can I just check with legal colleagues quickly, just to might have to redo that vote? Yeah.
yeah, I've just clarified. Sorry, I will have to do that. Um, second recommendation, additional recommendation again. Um, Co-optees, um, unfortunately, are not eligible to vote in this one. So my apologies if I read this one out again, just for clarification. So this is Councillor Porter's additional recommendation. So to recommend that the Children and Young People Select Committee receives a written report for every meeting till the committee are satisfied that the service has caught up and is providing a timely service for children, parents and schools and proof that the service is making progress. So can I have, apart from the co-optees, can I have a show of hands of any members who abstain, please? That's no abstentions. Can I have a show of hands for members who disagree with that additional recommendation? And keep your hands up, please, members. One, two, three, four, five. So we have seven disagree. And can I have a show of hands for members who agree, if those members can now put their hands down, and a show of members who agree with the recommendation, the additional one. And please keep your hands up, members. Sorry, yes, yeah, keep your hands up, please, members. I'm still counting. So oh, I have nine, nine members agree. So that recommendation is, is carried. Thank you members for your, for your patience. Right, uh, Jackie, are we content that we can move on to item eight? Yes, thank you. Chairman, can I, sorry to leave this point, but can I just ask the question? So when will this autism topic come back to the select committee is it the next is it for the january meeting or the one after the next county council elections do you want to raise that as part of the work program councillor bolton I, I will do chairman thank you thank you that would be fantastic um so thank you very much matthew i know you've got another important meeting this morning so thank you for bearing with us um, and we will move on to item eight now, which is the special educational needs and disabilities um, reforms update report um, on SEN performance and joint working, which I understand. Oh, Matthew, you're staying with us. It's Tracy Sanders and Matthew Powell. Thank you, Councillor North. I'll pop the presentation up on the screen. Um, and if you could let me know when you can see it, please. Will do. Thank you. Yeah, Can you we've see got it? it. We have. Great. Thank you very much, um, members, for um, allowing me to bring the annual SEND update to the Children and Young People Select Committee. Um, as members will know, the SEND um, offer is something that is multi agency. Um, as it involves education, health and care colleagues, as well as um, our parent support agencies. And so this presentation covers a broad range of updates from um, a collective of those people. Um, what I'm going to do is just uh, remind us a little bit of the SEND reforms um, and also update members on the recent Ofsted CQC inspection. Um, I'm going to provide an update of the SEN service work and the EHC hub, the Hampshire Parent Carer Network um, in, uh, work that they've been undertaking, some information around um, children and young people's SEN outcomes, um, and also information on outer county placement, our capital place planning strategy, our preparation for adulthood work, work from our Independent Futures team, work by the designated clinical officer, and I know you've just heard from Matt, um, and then work um, from our NHS colleagues and how that links with Matt's work 
And finally, an update on our appeals rate. So um, members will remember that um, the SEND reforms were launched in September 2014, and they brought a strengthened focus on working with parents and carers, children and young people in a collaborative way. Um, and they introduced the notion of an education, health and care plan, which combines advice and recommendations from all three agencies for children and young people up to 25 um, who had the most complex needs. It also um, asked local authorities to establish a local offer information web page and strengthened the focus on pre-EHCP work, that is work at SEND support and explained to us all that we needed to take a graduated response to children with SEN, building up to additional resources only where necessary, um, and that those resources should be jointly planned and commissioned across education, health and care. And that means both children and adults as the age range spans to 25 years old. The reforms provided a much stronger focus on year nine preparation for adulthood with the idea that we needed to build greater independence and an expectation around employment and it introduced a new Ofsted CQC inspection framework which measured the extent to which local authorities had responded to the SEND reforms. We had our inspection here in Hampshire in March 2020, and I'm really pleased to report that it was a very positive inspection. The majority of local authorities, particularly large local authorities like Hampshire, um, have what's called a written statement of action. Um, and that details the areas for, for improvement that a local authority has and necessitates Ofsted to come and visit again. In Hampshire, our letter was very positive. It outlined the strengths of the local authority. It did note areas for development, but Ofsted and CQC felt that there was absolutely no need for them to come back to Hampshire to check progress against our already comprehensive development plan. What Ofsted found was that in Hampshire, leaders are highly ambitious for children and young people to send, um, that the leaders are really committed to children succeeded and that our SEND strategy mirrors the ambitions of the reform, reforms from 2014. Um, the inspectors picked up that leaders and practitioners were passionate about improving the lived experience of children and young people with SEND and their families, and that we had really good outcomes for children through the provision of inclusive schools and early years providers and colleges, um, and that there was strong support for inclusion for those providers through the local authority offer, um, and that spanned right across the age ranges I've just mentioned. There was good multi-agency working recognised in the Ofsted and CQC inspection letter, um, and it was noted that we invested in provision where that was needed. The main area for development was um, around communication and co-production between parents, schools and services. Um, and it was really clear that there were some very good examples of co-production working, but in other areas, parents and children and young people weren't fully involved in the planning um, of their provision in school or the planning of services as they developed. And what Ofsted found was that whilst the local authority had really good plans in place to take their work forward and address some of the concerns that there are, um, that are no later on in this presentation, parents just didn't seem to be aware of those. And so um, there was a recommendation that we communicated better to parents about the good work that is going on. So I mentioned earlier um, that the reforms have been in place since 2014. And um, in Hampshire, that's had a really significant effect because we've seen a 95% increase in the number of uh, um, education, health and care plans since that point in time. We're currently maintaining almost 10,000, in fact, I think by now it is 10,000 plans in Hampshire. And the growth of education health care plans has been across all age ranges, although it's slightly uneven because as children have got older and, more, and eligible for 
um, the uh, plan up until the age of 25, that um, age range has increased most significantly. Um, but assessment requests continue to rise, um, and you'll see the figures there on the slide, but what we've had in the last year is a 41.3% increase. That's significantly higher than a national increase of 11%, and that's primarily because of the cessation of our census scheme, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Stuck. Um, this graph just shows members the growth that I mentioned in plans, and as you can see, it's across the age ranges, but particularly prevalent in the post-16 sector. Um, just to give some context to um, the work, over 5,000, nearly 6,000 children um, in Hampshire at school have an EHCP. Um, which is slightly above the national rate, as you can see on this slide. We have 40.3% of pupils in special schools in Hampshire, which again is above the national rate. Um, but we have slightly lower than the national rate of children at SEND support. So that's the early stage prior to having an education healthcare plan. So what we're finding in Hampshire is we're slightly more inclined to um, request and issue plans in the national level are slightly more inclined to place children in special schools, although there is an element of skewing of the data because um, we have so few sixth form um, provisions in our mainstream schools and sixth forms are counted in the national data that so slightly skews our data in Hampshire. Um, as I mentioned earlier, part of the reason our education healthcare assessment requests are, are so high is because we ceased the sensor pilot funding scheme, which was um, existing in schools over a year ago now, um, whereby schools could access the very lowest level of support to an EHCP without having to go through the process. What this did was mean that both the um, SEN service and the advice givers who are part of the assessment process had a significant increase in the number of assessments they had to main, um, respond to. Um, and um, although the local authority worked really quickly and hard to manage that predictive increase in assessment requests, it had a big in impact on the timeliness of our completing assessments. So there was an investment of 0.9 million rising to 1.6 million in the SEN service to get new staff and the EPs prioritised work um, away from traded services back into statutory work to get on top of this. I know Brian's already presented earlier um, that we've done a really good job in getting on top of the sensor backlog. What that amounted to after November um, 2019 was 1,500 plans being in that backlog because um, plans were added to it with the increase in assessment requests. We are now at the point of finalising all but 200 um, plans and they're in draft phase and uh, as Brian mentioned we're expecting those to be out more or less all of them by the end of this week. We're not expecting absolutely every one of them to be out because there's still some disputes around placement and description of need but we're hoping the majority will be out. Um, so um, this is Steve's favourite slide and it shows the backlog bulge passing through the um, SEN service and the advice agencies um, and it's really good news that the services have worked so hard to clear the backlog. Frustrating we know for parents and schools who've been waiting for an EHCP to be issued and we recognise that those plans in places are out of date because parents have been waiting for a long time. Um, but we're recommending to schools to have an early annual review, very much like we did when, when the statements were transferred to education healthcare plans, to make sure we've got the most up-to-date understanding of the child's needs and that the right kind of provision is in place. Um, but we wanted to get provision out to um, schools as quickly as we could in clearing the backlog on the information we had available to us. Um, so on top of clearing that backlog, which has been a phenomenal task, as I have just mentioned, we had really good um, performance through um, 
the phase transfer work. So this is work where the SEM service has to um, complete the um, annual review process for children who are about to go into the next phase of their education. Um, so that investment in staffing that I mentioned earlier also helped us to really focus on year two, year six and year 11 phase transfers. And we got more than ever completed on time this year. Um, and an update to that bottom bullet point is we have 93% of year 11 phase transfer plans either completed or in draft, which um, is the highest ever that we've achieved. Um, one of the reasons for that not being 100% is that as COVID hit us and year 11 pupils were deciding what to do, um, it's taken them a while to make final decisions and weigh up their um, the risks and their, their decision making about what they want to do. So we've still got a few to finalise, but we're more or less there with the year 11 phase transfers. Members will be aware that um, uh, on top of doing the day job, the SEN service also launched the Education, Health and Care Hub. And that is the one stop shop for um, assessments to be lodged and for plans to be managed. Um, and in February last year, Senkos came on board and began to request EHC assessments through the hub. Educational psychologists joined the process in the summer of 2019 and in November last year families uh, started to put requests onto the hub and were able to see the progress of their education healthcare assessment request and it's been really successful there have been some glitches um, as is always the way I think with IT provision but on the whole it's been very very successful we still have to bring our health and social care colleague advice writers um, on board and this had been planned um, over the summer break but COVID again has halted our progress with this however we are cracking on and um, we hope that our advice writers will be able to join us later at this autumn term so that the education healthcare hub assessment request process is completed we then need to turn to annual reviews and uh, we'll be launching that later on in this um, academic year so that's the work of the um, Hampshire SEN service. Moving on to Hampshire's Parent and Carer Network Forum, um, HPCN um, report that they now have a membership of just over um, 1,000 um, and they have a significant social media presence um, as noted on the slide. HPCN keep in touch with their members through a monthly newsletter. Um, and they facilitate various forums, which we find really useful to um, help with this co-production. So we meet the parents regularly, local authority officers and parents get together and go through personal issues and address concerns. And then HPCN also run get togethers in localities and the Futures in Mind program, um, where they're able to run parent support groups um, and we've used the get togethers in particular as forums for consultation, for example, on the STEM strategy. The really, really helpful work that HPCN do. Um, but their focus following the offset inspection and before is to make sure that they reach those harder to reach families, especially in the New Forest and Haven't, where membership is not what um, HPCN would like. Um, and they're keeping an eye on that and, and moving that piece of work forward. I mentioned earlier that Ofsted noted that outcomes for children and young people with um, SEN was um, a, a significant feature in um, our success. And certainly in the early years, um, children are doing well if they have an education healthcare plan or if they are accessing support through SEN support. Um, and we are above national for both those measures in the early years. Um, in key stage two for reading, writing and maths, and that's age related expectations for members, um, apologies for the acronym there, um, colleagues uh, who don't know GLD is good level of development um, on the earlier two bullet points. Um, for key stage two, for children with plans, um, we are again rising and above national. Um, and for SEN support, we are rising 
but unfortunately still below national. So we're pleased with the progress we're making, but we need to focus more on that area of our um, support offer for children. And it's the same story at Key Stage 4 in the basics, which is um, English, maths and um, science. Um, we are moving forward. Um, apologies, it's English and maths. Um, we're, we're moving forward for children with EHCP, um, but again, send support, although it's progressing and closing the gap on national isn't where we need it to be. However, um, level two attainment for children and young people at 19, really young people by 19, is above national and our sustained destination data is really good um, at 84%, um, which is above national. Generally in Hampshire, we don't exclude children um, uh, compared to national at the same rate if they have an SEN um, and on the whole our absence levels are um, uh, a, a low for children who have SEN. However, this is an area we continue to want to focus on because we do exclude more children than we do want with SEN um, and we need to improve attendee, uh, attendance for children with SEN as well. Um, we mentioned earlier, or I mentioned earlier, the Ofsted inspectors recognised the provision that we have in place for children with um, uh, SEN and um, that schools feel well supported with their professional development around that. One of the areas that we um, have been focusing on is the um, a number of children who are placed out of county and um, are um, accessing support that isn't um, Hampshire based and members will remember that we have a strategy which is our bring back strategy which is to make sure that um, children remain out of county only if that is the right decision for them. We had been in a position where we weren't able to attend annual reviews but we've now increased our attendance at annual reviews and last year we attended 180 annual reviews and reviewed with parents and young people the placement and where it was the right decision we did bring children back into community provision in Hampshire um, which is better for children and also has reduced the provision um, the pressure on the high needs block by two million pounds and we think probably each year we will be able to sustain that kind of saving against the high needs block but clearly obviously only where this is the right thing for children and young people and their families. Another area um, of focus for us is our place planning strategy. And one of the reasons it has taken us a long time to finalise plans is there's an awful lot of work around negotiating where children will be placed. Um, and we know we don't have sufficient provision in Hampshire for our children um, to access specialist provision um, in, to meet parental preference. Um, and that's a national issue and in Hampshire we're taking it very seriously and we've been able to utilise both DfE SENS capital funding and HCC capital funding to develop places. This isn't a quick fix and that does cause frustration for schools and parents but nonetheless we are increasing um, IASD provision by 125 places as members will know in the new school in Basingstoke. And we've also approved funding for 90 place co-educational SEMH provision with a target completion date in 2020. Between 2017 and 2019, we have developed over 230 new specialist places um, and we have plans in place to create another 300 additional specialist places by 2023, which sounds an awful lot, but I'm afraid we're still probably a little short, um, but we'll keep on working creatively with schools try and help um, schools meet um, the need of um, children with complex needs where they feel a specialist replacement would be more appropriate. I'll do that through outreach um, and additional funding packages. Um, we have some condition issues which we're working on um, and there is a five-year strategic plan as I mentioned earlier um, to improve our sufficiency. The key areas that we need to develop our provision is SEMH and ASD and I can't, see, I, can't see, I can't see the last point apologies but whatever it says on the slide because I can't see on my screen um, and it's 
Great. Bend knee. And this slide shows us um, where the, these new places are being developed. So hopefully members will be able to look at that more in more detail from their own pack. In terms of um, preparation for adulthood, there's um, a great deal of work going on around developing employment hubs. Um, and this slide lists where they are. That's um, to support young people with SEN into employment. <laughs> I'm hoping Tracy's not been eaten by the dog. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I had to go and stop the dog barking. You'd never have heard me. <laughs> um, I'll carry on. Um, independent living um, is an area that we're working on, and um, we have um, developed more work around travel training and um, life skills, and that's uh, significantly supported by Independent Futures colleagues, which I will um, talk about in a minute. And we've been promoting community inclusion and health and well-being for our young people. The Independent Futures team are the team who transition children between adult and children's social care. And um, this slide highlights the um, increasing use of technology that they found has been useful in um, developing independence and also um, the increase in numbers of young people who have become known to the service and they supported, but um, to note that this is an area that still needs further development. Um, finally, you've heard today from Matt, um, uh, and he has um, talked a lot about the autism pathway work that's been going on. Matt's been doing an awful lot with us around making sure we strengthen the relationship with um, our health colleagues and he leads on the Transforming Care Partnership, um, the procurement of integrated therapies, and also um, makes sure that we um, work collaboratively through the Integrated Care Partnership work. NHS um, have also um, supported us through the Integrated Care System, and there's an aligned procurement programme um, which brings together health visiting, school nursing, and other areas of work. Um, and all that is detailed in the Joint Hampshire and Isle White Local Transformation Plan. Uh, finally, um, our appeals in Hampshire seem to be stabilising, um, and um, I just want to note the good work of the SEN service um, alongside parent organisations who support um, parents and the local authority in resolving um, issues before we get to hearing. And finally, a reminder that if um, members want to find out more about the provision that's available in Hampshire, here's a link to our local offer website. So um, that is the end of the presentation, and I'm ready to take any questions. Okay. Thank you very Thanks. much, Tracy. Um, first off, we have Councillor Michael Westbrook, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Tracy. Just uh, got a couple of very sort of briefish sort of questions. The first one relates to the outcomes for children and young people we send, where it talks about the early years where we're above the average. Um, but when it comes to uh, key stage two, um, we are below national average. And I just wondered if you could maybe just pick up on that slightly. Um, and my other question is a little bit long-winded in relation to the independent futures team. Um, it talks about learning disability plan review 2018, where people with learning disabilities and their carers said that one of the most important things to them was employment. And at point 55 in our report, it states that Hampshire has seen a sustained increase in the percentage of adults with a learning disability known to social care in paid employment, but Hampshire remains below the national average. And further on in the report, it also talks about the changes that have been made to the ways into work. Um, contract to improve the percentage of young people and adults with a learning disability into paid employment. And that plans includes working more closely with Hampshire's futures. So I've got a couple of 
questions out of that little bit, which is uh, my question is how badly affected are those efforts to support the lives of these young adults as a result of COVID? Um, and also Councillor Chad, um, I think still on the line with us today, uh, mentioned recently under her portfolio on the 14th of September, that Hampshire County Council is putting in place a raft of support to help residents get into work if they become unemployed or had difficulty finding work or after leaving educational training due to COVID and also mentioned the government's kickstart scheme. So I wondered whether Councillor Chad could tell us whether those proposals also include support for people with learning difficulties um, and those getting back into work. Thank you. Tracy, shall I do the attainment one and some of the post-16 work into uh, work and you, you pick up the other bits, is that okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, so um, you, you're right, Councillor Westbrook, and, and we wanted to be transparent with the data. Where children have an EHCP, our outcomes are better than the national average. Are we satisfied with those outcomes, given that it still only means that 10% of them are reaching national expectations. No, we're not. It just means we're doing slightly better than the national average. In terms of those that are on SENSE support, I think there are two things at play there. Whilst we have the same proportion of students with an EHCP as the national average, we have less students identified at SENSE support. And therefore, I think we've got a smaller slice of the normal distribution curve and some authorities are including children with far less special needs within that definition and therefore you might expect them to achieve highly if they've got less special needs. It's been a real focus of our work now for the last two years. Every single annual visit we take to, um, we make to schools, SEND support is an area we are prodding and investigating and trying to encourage better school performance. That's why you'll see the data was showing a rapid improvement. Um, and Ofsted were pleased with the improvement we were making, but there's still a journey to be undertaken and we still want better work. Um, in terms of the post-16 work, uh, moving into work, the world of work, absolutely. The Hampshire Futures team are very focused on children with special educational needs. Um, particularly under the September guarantee to make sure that they are moving into employment, education and training. And we're expecting low proportions of children that are neat. Um, Kickstart is an area that we are um, really keen to play a full part in. And we've put ourselves forward as potentially the in intermediary um, place for the public sector. So including... Um, district councils, health authority, to try and get the students in there. And one of the areas we would want to target in that is children with special needs. The other area that we've got is we recently commissioned four new employability hubs located in colleges, which is trying to encourage students to access college courses that lead to work. And we've got a, a provider that's working alongside us to try and ensure that those young people can come off an EHCP and into the world of work, into a valuable um, piece of work. So it, it's absolutely a key focus of our, our work, um, world to make sure that um, children with SEN are supported post-16. Has that answered your question, Councillor Westbrook, or did you need anything else? No, I think that's fine. I think I, I think it's just about that that extra bit of fund that is available. Uh, Brian's talked about the kickstart bit, which is important because obviously you know it, it, it this should be for everybody. So, you know, I think Brian makes his answer to that really well. Thank you very much for that, Brian. Thank you, Councillor Jackie Branson. Then, please. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, you, you've talked about sort of the top end of the education, but what about those children that are starting school? Because I think there was some delay this year on um, on um, as some of the EHCPs for the children that were beginning school. I just wondered how many children you'd have to have EHCPs for, and um, have we sort of got over the, the delay that there was this year? Thank you. Um, yes. We prioritised, um, when we knew we had the backlog, we prioritised children who are at phase transfer points, including children who are in um, year R minus one, about to go into year R, and also those children who were out of school because they were unable to attend, because uh, we felt they were the, mo the most vulnerable. Um, out of the um, 
all those plans that we've finalised, the, the, that we will have a significant majority of children with EHCPs entering into school that have now had those finalised. So um, I think there will be very, very few year R minus one children who um, are just joining school that haven't had their plan now agreed. Where there may be one or two, it will be because the parents are in dispute with us around where we are naming, school we're naming, or um, the description of their children's needs. But the majority of children now entering school where an assessment request was made before school have now got their plan in place. Okay, thank you. Councillor Anne Briggs. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Tracy, for your report. The young people with complex needs that we send out of county placements, I don't know how many we do send out, but um, in, in one part it says you're going to negotiate without your county providers to for more cost effective block bookings and then in the next bit it says a specific work stream is in place to explore and negotiate with independent providers. Is that providers in Hampshire or are we still going to send quite a lot of young people out of county? We um, Thank you Councillor Briggs. We do use independent providers in Hampshire as well as out of county. Um, and so the work stream around what we call smarter commissioning will focus both on our Hampshire independent uh, providers as well as our out of county providers with a view to us if we know we are likely to use them and um, have a number of children who usually go to that provision, could we have um, a, a better deal really on the cost of placements? Um, we will always have a need to place in the independent sector, partly because it's our buffer around sufficiency of provision where we don't have enough specialist places in Hampshire, but partly because those independent providers um, sometimes offer something very unique and specialist um, that we wouldn't have the demands to offer in Hampshire. And so um, they offer something to a number of local authorities and they, they gather those very unique needs all in one place. Um, so it's not so much we don't want to use the INNSS, that's the independent non-maintained sector, it's more we want to use the sector at the right times when we uh, require that specialist input and pay the sort of price that we feel is a fair deal. At the moment it's very much a seller's market because there's so much pressure on provision. As I mentioned earlier, um, what we are trying to do though is increase our specialist provision in Hampshire and make it more attractive for parents who often um, want an independent provider as opposed to one of our maintained providers, which is a shame because we've got really, really good special schools in Hampshire. Yes, thank, thank you for that. But it's always worrying when I, I think our children are sent out of the county because I think we take such good care of them here. And I'm sure they have a social worker or someone who keeps a check on how they're doing? Okay. Yes, we do. We, um, social care will um, check if those children are um, in the care of the, the provider um, and also um, where uh, we go to annual reviews where we um, can and, and regularly check. So there's a, a system in place for checks. Thank you. And one more quick question, if I may, Chairman. In all our talents, will that take place this year because of COVID? I don't know, but I will double check for you and get back to you directly because I, I haven't asked that question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Malcolm Wade was next, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I've got a, a couple of questions, really. Uh, the first one is in relation to the um, Ofsted report. It, it identified a, a great many strengths in the organisation, but it also identified an areas for improvement. Uh, and uh, one or two are quite significant. Are, are we are putting together a plan to do that? That's question number one. Uh, question number two is, is actually about the tribunals, because I, I noticed that the number of tribunals in the last couple of years has remained fairly static, right? Uh, and um, the, the question with that is, is it still true to say 
that more tribunals are run by the parents than the authority. And are, are we, can we do anything to try and improve the level of parental dissatisfaction in this process? Because at the moment it looks like it's pretty, pretty static year on year. If I can deal with the first bit on the action plan, the reason why we didn't have to get, have a repeat inspection and the reason why they didn't um, give us a letter, Councillor Wade, was because the areas they identified were the areas we told them we thought there were weaknesses and we'd already got action plans in place to deal with. So they looked at the quality of our action planning around those areas and decided it was of a high quality, which is why they, we, we got the report we did. So yes, we do. We had already got action plans in place, but we have um, reinvented those action plans in the light of Ofsted's findings as well. Thank you. Um, and, I just, can, um, I, can I just come in on the tribunals thing before you you go into that? Um, it is it's it's a very strange thing, and I and I think I said before that whilst I don't particularly like the tribunal system. If it wasn't there would probably have to invent something that looked quite a bit like it um because it's an end it's a it's a backstop it's the end point and um whilst there are lots of cases in tribunal what you don't see are the ones that don't go to tribunal because they the claimants know that they would not win if i can put it that way and so they get filtered out so disproportionately it looks like we lose, <coughs> and frankly the odds are stacked against us. Um, but if we didn't, if we didn't fight on particular points, and I'm, it's unfortunate to use the word fight, but it is part of our duty, then um, we wouldn't be doing part of our duty, which is to ensure best value for the public purse. And it's a really tricky thing. And, you know, I'd, I'd love nothing more than to concede everything and say yes, off you go. Here you are. But that's not our job. That's not what we're required to do by law. And we must um, ensure that the public purse gets best value. And um, that does end, end up with a sort of quasi judicial process, unfortunately. So it's really, really, really tricky. But I think there's, it's all, I can't, much as I dislike it personally, I actually can't, genuinely can't think of a different way to do it because you're always going to need that endpoint. Sorry, Tracy, do you want to come in any further on that? Well, no, I, th I think you've covered it well, Steve, thank you. But I, I think the only um, thing to mention is that the SEN service will work really closely with families and try and avoid tribunal. And we do try and um, work hard to, to find a compromise where the public purse allows. Um, and one of the um, things that I've been driving forward in my review of the SEN service is um, developing the early intervention strand of work so that we get in early as disputes bubble up and we don't let them amount to the point where we're, we're facing each other in tribunal and an awful lot of resource and, and anxiousness for parents as well, anxiety for parents um, happens. We, we would want to avoid that as far, far as possible, bearing in mind all that Steve has said, um, but we, you know, we will work hard to avoid tribunals whenever we can. Chairman, I didn't quite get one of the answers to the questions. I totally understand that, and I understand the public purse, why, why you have the process. But is it true, is it a true fact that we, the ones that do get the tribunal, we lose more than we win or, or by significant? Uh, and that the reason I, I raise that is because you're right, it creates lots of extra work for us and it creates anxiety with the parents and, and, and in some cases the children. Uh, is, is there a way of trying to trying to rectify this this issue it, it's the, one of the definitions of, is lose uh, it, you know because so although you know we see tribunals the parents uh, get their own um, way, or, although the, the the judge finds in favor of most of the claimants mm -hmm. claim there are aspects of it that we win and some of those aspects are important to us in terms of setting precedent for other cases and so forth Okay. So even even the lose win thing is not quite as clear cut as as you might think on on the first occasion. And all I can say is that we we really wouldn't we try everything not to go into tribunal, not to go to hearing. And it's only where there's an important point of either principle or um, uh, dispute that we can't resolve that we we will go there. There's loads there's loads that start on the on the journey but never get there. 
there really okay. is. Um, yeah. All right, thank you. Thanks. Councillor Jackie Porter's next, please. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Tracy. Uh, a very uh, comprehensive report, report. And also thank you to Matthew, who I gather has stayed on the line. Um, the report from uh, the Office Inspector very clearly said that leaders are highly ambitious for children and young people. And so I don't want to take that away from the report that, that's written. It's very clear that Steve and the whole team uh, have a very, very high ambition for children. Um, but going back to the point we raised earlier with autism, we knew that this was something that was ongoing for many years, actually. Um, and I wonder if... Um, the comments on page 55 were why Matthew was actually asked to take this on because it says that uh, there is no, uh, there is a, a, distinct, a distinct, distinct deficit in what's happening for autistic children and about angry parents who are waiting too long uh, and about the fact that annual reviews and updates sometimes didn't happen. And I wonder as well, um, the last page is about the equality duty, and we tend to read that as a bit of paper that's just there at the end of a report. But actually, in this particular case, it really is about equality for these children. Are we giving them a full time education as a matter of course? Is it something that we're automatically assuming will happen? Because um, in my experience, those children who uh, are struggling um, to get the full justification they need within the, the the state system are the ones that are coming to seek help either through a tribunal or just being very, very angry. And also, I just wanted to raise the question of the Habitat Parent Care Network. We we cut their budget last year. Uh, well, we've cut it pretty much consistently the last few years. And is this adding to their challenge of trying to reach every single child and parent in the district? Because um, certainly I know their wings have been cut to a certain extent. Um, and I just wondered, have we, it's, it's a big ask for them with a cutting budget to make sure they effectively are acting as our conduit. Um, are we using other conduits and do parents who don't sign up to Hampshire Parent Care Network feel genuinely represented? Thank you. So, like, should I pick up the parent one first? And then, oh, Matt, yeah. um, I'm just wondering if you want to come in on the AFB and, um, and I, either I can pick up on equality's impact or uh, Steve might want to. In terms of um, the parent, Hatcher Parent Care Network, um, they um, are building up their representation, but you rightly point out, Council Reporter, they don't represent everybody. Um, we do seek views of parents in a variety of ways, and obviously, Hampshire Local Offer is our main way of getting information out to parents and also seeking feedback from parents. And similarly, contact with schools. Our schools are a really good place to hear um, what it is parents are finding works for them and what it doesn't, and we get the messages through our meetings with schools, and often parents are involved in those. Um, annual reviews are a particularly good example of that. Um, Around the funding with HPCN, um, I don't have the exact detail in terms of how much funding we do or don't give them, but what I can say is they're definitely increasing their membership. And uh, what's really interesting, and I know members had a presentation earlier about our response to COVID, but one of the things HPCN has done is really um, uh, come to grips with the virtual way of working in the same way we all have. Um, and the meetings that they have are so much more accessible now they are um, virtual. Um, our most recent Meet the Parents um, sessions have been very, very successful and seen large numbers of parents accessing um, an ability to hear from leaders uh, that were mentioned in the OSCED inspection um, and the updates that we want to give to parents, but also to um, answer parents' questions directly. So. Um, I have to say that um, as a, I, I'm not completely okay with exactly how much the funding has shifted, but certainly in terms of practice, I can see HPCN thriving in terms of its ability to represent parents um, at the moment. It's, it's doing a great job. Perhaps I should just Perhaps. interject to uh, inform members that Suzanne Smith has kindly posted in our chat that HCPN have not had their funding cut, um, but there's a proposal 
from April 2021, which is subject to decision in November. Or I apologise. Make members I aware of that. I apologise. I thought it was this year. You're right. T21. And Councillor Porter, if I pick up on the ASC moving into my portfolio issue, I think I, I petitioned for that, to be perfectly honest with you, because I believe it needed more of an unrelenting focus to change it. The difficulty with it being sat in a cameras portfolio is it will never bubble to the top because it isn't deemed a high enough priority because there's bigger clinical risk within CAMS, whereas it fits very neatly within the special educational needs and disabilities portfolio, and I can offer more attention to it. Um, and in terms of the equalities impact assessment, um, obviously everything we do um, in the SENS reform work is all about trying to improve um, outcomes for children with disabilities. So I think the reference in the report is really to say the journey we are on is a journey and it's all about trying to give children a better deal really um, and build upon the successes we have. So. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that totally answers your question um, or whether there's, there's something more you wanted to unpick in that area. I think it related particularly to the fact that um, some parents didn't feel represented um, for their children. Uh, and it, it highlighted, in fact, traveller children in the report, I think. Uh, but there are many other groups of parents who have said to me that they, well not many, but some have said to me that because they don't necessarily be join in with HPCN, they don't feel represented. But you've reassured me a little that the fact that we're doing it direct through schools as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Robert Sanders is next, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just quick question in terms of standards achieved by those with SCND and SCND support and so on. Is there a, um, a concern that the gap between attainment of that group and those without um, is potentially going to widen as a, as a consequence of um, COVID and lack of specialist support in schools um, over recent times? Um, and as a consequence of that, um, is there any extra support being made available in terms of training, um, network meetings, etc.? Are they still taking place? And you know, if so, is there any attendance at these? Um, interesting question, Rob. So we are currently doing a piece of work looking at um, GCSE outcomes for the last year's year 11. Um, obviously, none of that is published, so we're having to talk individually to schools on that. We have a suspicion that actually the children that come from um, free school meals, SEN support, maybe the students that have got their grade fours and above that historically haven't, but we need to do that piece of work to check that hypothesis um, out. Um, cl clearly you're right that the students that find learning more challenging and therefore make less progress and therefore have less attainment, you might expect to be disproportionately affected by any lengthy absence from school. Um, and that's why it's really important to get the right recovery curriculum and the right catch up in programs in place for the right students. So that's a piece of work we will have to work on really hard. But if people think that's gonna be fixed by a six months intervention, sadly in my view, I think they're wrong. I think it's gonna be much a lengthier process than, than that. Yeah, thank you, thank you Brian. Okay, and then Ian Brewton, please. Oh, sorry, I, I don't have a question. Oh, no problem, okay. Any other members with a question? Are we happy to move to our recommendation? Just give members a second. I see no hands, so we will move on to the recommendation, and that's just that the Children and Young People Select Committee note the update. So if we could just have a show of hands that we are agreed with noting the update. Fantastic. Lots of hands gone up, so that is agreed. And we will just move on to item nine, which is our work programme. Um, and I just want to highlight to you 
um, you can see it in the agenda pack. There's updates in red um, since our last meeting, and you'll see that we do have quite a few items coming up for our next two meetings. So they will be quite packed agendas as it is. Um, so I understand, um, Councillor Bolton, you um, very rightly wish to raise um, the autism assessments um, after that item. And I asked you very kindly if you could wait to the work programme. Would you like to um, bring that back up now? Yes, Chairman, thank you very much. Um, following the re recommendation we decided on at the end of the autism presentation, the next the next meet or the first meeting in 2021 is in January, 13th of January. And then the second one, I believe, won't occur until after the County Council elections in May. So therefore, autism, which we've all agreed, this um, action plan um, is such an important topic that either it is contained in the work uh, program to be reviewed again in January, which would be what some four and a half months from now, or if it's not reviewed in January, then it will be at the end of May. So that's getting on for nine months from now. So I hope that once we will begin receiving our written updates, we, we should receive one in November and January uh, following Jackie Porter's recommendation, which we approved. Um, so we should be um, receiving information from them um, and that may well suffice for those two months. But if members were keen following the information that we received to put it back on the agenda, then um, comfortable with doing that but I just wanted to highlight that we already have quite a few items which some of them are um, set that we need to look at them the pre-scrutiny at, at those dates but uh, Councillor Malcolm Ray, you've got your hand up Oh, no problem at all. Councillor Jackie Porter. Okay, I'd just like to raise the fostering one because this is to be brought to a future meeting, but I know that uh, some work's being done on the fostering um, programme at the moment, and it would be good to see that before the end of this uh, council four years, because a lot of us have watched this with interest over the last uh, few years. And in light, particularly in light of, or one of the aspects is in light of the um, case ruling that's changed over the summer, which is about uh, employ the employment rights of fosterers. Uh, and I suspect that uh, that will have an impact on the uh, final changes that are made to fostering. But also, I think that the team have got some very positive changes they're hoping to make. So it'd be good to review those as well. Before the end of before May. Can I can I just come in on? I, I agree with the sentiment. Um, we'd quite like to do it. I suppose it's just pressure on the timetable. Just on the particular point about the uh, legal ruling, it's I, I've been in touch previously with my colleague in Glasgow. It's a very very narrow judgment around a very specific scheme. It's not a general judgment, so I don't think it makes that much difference to us or or nationally. Um, but we can cover that when we come back to the topic, whenever that may be. Thanks, Steve. I know it hasn't got a date. That's the point of that one. And again, like Ray said, you know, it, we finished this this session finishes in May, and we don't have a date for that one. Yes. We unfortunately, a few of our items don't have dates, which but they will obviously be carried on um, beyond May. Hopefully, uh, we will all be here to listen to them. But um, I, I do note your point about the fostering one, um, Jackie. And if you 
want to suggest an item to shift, I'm happy to listen to your um, idea on that one. I mean, it's it is tight. There's a case for us to receive more reports that we should have read before we get here rather than making presentations against reports we've already got the paper off. That might speed things up. I concur. Well, perhaps we we'll, we could squeeze it in. Um, but I'll leave that up to um, officers to make a case for whether that's in November or January in that case. I appreciate your support, Councillor North. <laughs> <laughs> OK, in that case, can we uh, recommend that we agree the work programme then, please, just by a show of hands? Fantastic. Thank you very much. And that brings us to the end of the meeting. Thank you all very much, members. I will now uh, request that the webcast is stopped.